somebody could turn their phones on, or their phones on, sorry. <laughs> their, um, the camera's on. <laughs> their phone's on. Um, let's see, maybe get you all in here in a few minutes. <laughs> Just working my heart out. Okay, we'll go ahead and start the meeting. Good evening, welcome to our 6 p.m. of the November 30th, 2021 meeting of the Santa Cruz City Council. I have a few announcements and then we'll move on to our meeting. Today's meeting is being broadcast live on community television channel 25 and streaming on the city's website at cityofsantacruz.com. If you wish to comment on an item today, call in at the beginning of the item you're wanting to comment on using the instructions on your screen. Please mute your television or streaming device once you call in and listen through the phone. Please note there is a delay in streaming, so if you continue to listen on your television or streaming device, you may miss your opportunity to speak. When it is time for public comment, press star nine on your phone to raise your hand when it is your time to speak during public comment, you will hear an announcement that you have been unmuted. The timer will then be set to two minutes. You may hang up once you have commented on your item of interest. And I would like to ask the clerk to please call the roll. Council Member Watkins? Here. Valentary Johnson? Here. Brown? Here. Member Cummings is currently absent. Boulder? Here. Vice Mayor Bruner? Present. And Mayor Myers? Present. Thank you, Bonnie. Oh, I see Council Member Cummings is, 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 is present. We will go ahead and I just want to, uh, just for the public, tonight's uh, meeting is a study session, so we will not be um, having oral communications um, at the end of the evening as we typically would in a normal uh, council session. So I just want to make that announcement up front. So we'll move on to our general business item, um, and that is uh, the regional housing needs allocation update. Um, 
which is item, agenda item number two on our agenda or on our agenda this evening. For members who are pub, of the public who are streaming this meeting, if this is an item you want to come on comment on, now is the time to call in using the instructions on your screen. We're going to have a presentation, and um, then we will have discussion, and uh, we'll go from there. So I want to turn this over. I believe Matt Vadenois is going to be our uh, uh, staff for this. Hi, good evening, Mayor. I'm actually gonna hand this over to uh, Heather Adamson with AMBAG to begin the presentation tonight. Great, thank you, Matt. Welcome, Heather. Saw her on, there she is. Heather, if you press star six to unmute, you should be ready to go. And in Bo Bonnie, is she good for being a panelist and putting up she her- She is a panelist. Okay. Heather, I see you in a box, but I don't see a, Yeah, there you go. You okay. Can you now. hear me now? Yes, we can. Okay. And can you see my screen? We cannot see your screen yet. Okay. <laughs> Hang on one second. I thought it said share, but it's not actually sharing yet. I apologize for the delay. No worries. Okay. And, and while that's loading, I, I just wanted a brief counsel. We're, we're going to hear from Heather Adamson with AMBEG first, uh, talking about the RENA process. Uh, and then after some council discussion with Heather, some questions, uh, then we'll be following with a, a staff presentation, uh, furthering the RENA discussion and the housing element process, uh, next steps to come. Thank you, Matt. You can take it away, Heather. Okay, I'm still, can you guys still hear me? I'm still having trouble sharing my screen, so maybe either Bonnie I or Matt can look yeah, my presentation. I have a presentation. Okay. I'm happy to share it. Hold on one second. Perfect. That would be good. And Heather, we, we understand you have a time, a bit of a time constraint tonight, so we'll be respectful of your time to make sure that if you, I think you have till six. Yeah, my other my other meeting got pushed back a little bit, so I'm available till about six forty five, six fifty. Oh, thanks very much for letting us know. Okay, welcome. Yes. We can see we okay. can see it now. Perfect. Okay, so good evening, uh, council members. Um, tonight I'm going to talk about the six cycle regional housing needs allocation, or some may know it as uh, RENA, for short. Um, my name is Heather Adamson. I am the planning director at the Association of Monterey Bay Area Governments, or RENA, or AMBAG. So let's let's get into it. Next slide, please. So a little bit of background. Um, I don't know who's oh. controlling the. It's me. Hold hold on one second. Okay. So just a little bit of background. Um, this is something that AMBAG is responsible for doing every eight years. It is, um, there we go. Okay, it's something that AMBAG is responsible um, for updating every eight years. It is tied to the schedule of developing our sustainable community strategy. And that change was made back in 2008 as part of Senate Bill 375. Um, we're a little bit unique in the, in the uh, Central Coast area, although AMBAG is the Metropolitan Planning Organization, the federally designated transportation planning organization for three counties, of Monterey, Santa Cruz, and San Benito counties. We are only the Council of Governments for Monterey and Santa Cruz, um, and that is a state designation. And San Benito uh, COG uh, is responsible for preparing RENA for the three jurisdictions within San Benito. And so AMBAG is responsible for the other 18 jurisdictions, uh, 16 uh, cities within the two counties of Monterey and Santa Cruz. Um, as I mentioned, this is something we do every eight years. Um, our last time we were talking about this was back in 2013, 2014. I'm not sure how many folks were on the council then. Um, but a lot of things have changed since uh, the last cycle. 
um, the six cycle planning period for our arena period is uh, from June 30th, 2023 to December 15th, 2031. It's a little bit of an overlap from our last arena cycle, uh, our fifth cycle, um, but that is determined by the uh, California Department of Housing and Community Development. Um, and as I mentioned, it's tied to the adoption and preparation and adoption of our local sustainable community strategy. And I did receive, um, the state is responsible for um, preparing a regional housing need determination for each region. Uh, AMBAG did receive this back in August, um, a few months ago. Um, and this is how many units the region must plan for as part of their housing element update. Our determination for six cycle was 33,274 units. Uh, to put this in perspective, this cycle from 2014 to 2023 was 10,430. So that is more than three times uh, the number of units uh, from uh, the previous cycle. And I'll explain a little bit why that happened. Um, next slide, please. So the RENA process is um, outlined in statute and it's very specific and, um, next slide. There we go. Um, it's very specific um, who has responsibilities for what. It starts at the state level um, with the California Department of Housing and Community Development, HCD, and they work with the COG, um, AMBAG in this case, and the Department of Finance on collecting data um, about the region, uh, very specific housing, job, employment, um, all kinds of data, um, age data, race data, um, all kinds of data. Um, we share that information. They use that information in analyzing and producing the arena determination. This started in early 2021, um, and AMBAG, as I mentioned, received that determination from HCD at the end of August. They came to our board meeting in uh, the September board meeting and presented information about how they came up with that determination. Um, then it moves to the, the AMBAG realm. Uh, AMBAG's responsibility is to develop a RENA plan. Um, the main part of this plan is to develop a methodology um, to allocate the number, the complete number of units, housing units that were assigned. Um, to each local jurisdiction. We need to develop that methodology. We need to put that uh, draft allocation of units for each of the jurisdictions in a draft plan. We go through a public process and review and potential appeal by local jurisdictions of the draft plan and adoption of the final arena plan. Um, this has started earlier this year. AMBAG has worked very closely with our local jurisdictions uh, planning staff. Uh, we've been meeting monthly for most of the year to discuss the RENA methodology and RENA allocation, um, and then get providing updates and getting direction from our board um, as well. Um, a new component of the six cycle is HDD, the California Department of Housing and Community Development, now is responsible uh, by changes to statute uh, to review and approve our RENA methodology. So each region can develop their own methodology but HCD must review and approve it. And this is completely new and um, uh, for this six cycle process. Uh, once uh, AMBAG has finalized the RENA plan, uh, which it's expected to do in 2022 next year, um, then it gets turned over to the local jurisdictions like the city of Santa Cruz. And um, your, uh, each jurisdiction is responsible for updating their housing element. And as part of that housing element, um, AMBAG isn't involved necessarily in, in developing your housing element. That is entirely up to the, each local jurisdiction how that is done. Um, and uh, discussion and reviewing of the draft housing element and any policies or actions that go into the housing element is a conversation between each local jurisdiction and uh, HCD because it is ultimately HCD who reviews and approves your housing element, each city's housing element. And so each jurisdiction will receive arena allocation and that's what they need to update and plan and potentially rezone uh, in their housing element or as part of their housing element development 
and that must be done. The deadline for our region's jurisdiction is December 2023. So from start to finish, this is a couple year process um, and AMBAG has been trying to work quickly um, and prudently through and requesting early consultation with HCD so we could um, make sure we give jurisdictions as much time as possible to prepare their housing elements. Um, next slide, please. I um, want to talk a little bit about what's new, and this will kind of explain why everyone's uh, arena numbers have been going up in six cycle. So uh, we had a number of legislative bills that went into place, um, went into, um, were approved, and went into um, law uh, a few years back. And it led to increased RENA allocations as um, for all jurisdictions or for all regions. Um, and everyone's RENA period is a little bit different. AMBAG um, is sort of later in on the sixth cycle uh, compared to other regions of the state. Other regions have gone through this already. Um, our friends to the south in Santa Barbara and San Luis Obispo, they've already gone through their sixth cycle and have the RENA plans and number of the jurisdictions have already done their housing elements. Our friends to the north, um, in the Bay Area, uh, they're just wrapping up their final arena plan and their jurisdictions will be um, preparing their housing elements. So we're in a little, everyone's in a little different timing, but we all have these new issues that have led to greater increase in arena allocation. A lot of it has to do with um, the bills listed on the screen above that were passed and uh, enrolled, um, having to do with um, setting vacancy rates. Uh, the state doesn't want to see a super low vacancy rate. Um, they want to see a reasonable available housing stock available. Uh, overcrowding is a huge issue for our region. And we have a number of jurisdictions that are very, very overcrowded. And that is one of the biggest reasons why AMBAG region got a, a large increase in the arena allocation compared to last time. Um, higher than average housing cost burdens as compared to other regions. Um, we are not allowed to use um, underproduction of uh, housing growth or because we have a stable population growth to reduce our green goals. We cannot do that. Um, and then another new factor um, that we have to do and have to look at um, is require our methodologies to promote fair housing and reduce income and racial segregation when allocating the housing. And so this is a new factor that we've had to consider in developing arena allocation methodology that we have not had to consider before. So it's gotten a lot more complicated. Uh, next slide, please. So as I mentioned, um, each council of government and is AMBAG in our region is responsible for developing a methodology that is appropriate, region appropriate. Um, but they all must further and support the five arena objectives and they're summarized um, on the screen here, um, increase housing supply and mix, promote infill equity and environment, ensure jobs, housing balance and fit, um, promote regional income parity, and affirmatively furthering fair housing. And what we've heard predominantly from the state over and over again, um, the last two objectives really are what they're focusing in on. Those are the new objectives. Um, the RENA statute allows for some uh, flexibility in how we develop our methodology but it very clearly says what can and can that cannot be used as allocation factors. And keep in mind, even if AMBAG board approves uh, ARENA methodology, we still must submit it to the state for their review and approval. Um, if they don't agree or confirm that it meets this, and it can't just meet, it has to further support the five ARENA objective, they can send it back and say, please continue working on this. So it's a, it's a balance. Uh, next slide, please. So AMBAG has, as I mentioned, has been developing methodology uh, options over the past seven, eight months uh, for discussion at the planning staff level with all our local jurisdictions, as well as at our, uh, with our board of directors. And the priority factors that our arena methodology has been focusing on is expected housing growth, existing jobs, existing transit access, a resiliency factor that takes a, a look at wildfire areas and sea level rise, because perhaps we should not be focusing additional housing in those type of areas, and then promoting fair housing and reducing income and racial segregation when allocating housing. 
um, we took a draft methodology for this, um, multiple draft methodologies for discussion. At our November meeting, we held a public hearing uh, to receive additional feedback um, and from our board and direction, as well as uh, public comment. Uh, we did receive a number of public comment, uh, so much so that we've, uh, the board took action to continue the public hearing until uh, December 8th at a special board meeting. So we'll be having a meeting next month to continue um, the public hearing on ARENA methodology. And um, the board at that time uh, is expected to select the ARENA methodology and direct staff to submit that uh, to the state for review. Uh, next slide, please. So just a little, just following up and kind of wrapping up about the schedule. Um, we've been working on RENA development really at the Planning Directors Forum, which is planning directors from all local jurisdictions in the region, uh, meeting almost monthly, sometimes twice a month um, since spring to develop this. And of course, discussing and getting direction from our board. Um, we are, as I just mentioned, um, expecting our board to select a methodology uh, to uh, uh, submit uh, to HCD for review and approval. Um, assuming they do approve, um, the HCD does concur that the methodology supports and furthers uh, the RENA objectives. They'll uh, provide that determination to us in early 2022, it's about 60 day review period. Uh, depending on when we get this, the board will then take action on approving that as its final methodology, either in February or March and um, direct staff to issue that draft RENA plan, including every jurisdiction's official RENA allocation, and that's expected in March. Um, there is an appeal period, a public review period, an appeal period uh, for local jurisdictions. If that happens, um, we haven't had appeals in the past with the past cycle, but of course there's been um, many appeals through the sixth cycle in other parts of the uh, state. Um, if that happens, um, then that will happen in spring and into summer. If that does not happen, uh, the final RENA plan could be approved as early as June. Um, and if we do go through the uh, receive an appeals, then we'll go through the appeals review process, appeals hearing, and then we can um, uh, most likely would adopt a final RENA plan in September. Uh, so it just depends if we get appeals uh, on the draft RENA allocation. Um, bottom line is each jurisdiction will need to um, prepare their six cycle housing element um, and submit that to HCD for their review and approval uh, by December of 2023. And I'd be happy, uh, next slide is just a question slide with my contact information. And so that's just a quick overview uh, of where we are. Uh, Matt of your staff has been attending uh, all the meetings and uh, I'm sure if he has any specific, specific questions related to uh, City of Santa Cruz comments, um, as well as Director Cummings has attended the board meetings and has uh, provided comments and feedback on that. But I'd be happy to answer any questions that you may have on the renal process. Thank you, Heather. <clears throat> I'll turn this um, over to council for questions. Here I see Martine Watkins. Thank you for the presentation and for the overview of the process and for all your work in getting it to this place. Um, my question was in regards to the overcrowding definition. Is that like doubled up housing that you're, is that how that's defined? Yes, so um, of course there's lots of definitions of overcrowding. Um, for RENA, it's um, using a specific HCD standard and so for it would mean um, it's a very conservative definition of overcrowding. And so it would mean um, over, an overcrowded, for example, a, a one, um, a two bedroom house, if there were three people in there, that would be considered an overcrowded unit. Yeah, okay, that's what I thought. Thank you for clarifying. Yes. Uh, I have uh, Council Member Brown and then I'll, uh, Vice Mayor Bruner. Thank you for the presentation and for all of your work to try to make sense of a very complex uh, data set and set of goals and um, just kind of everything that you have to consider. Uh, I, have, I have a couple of questions. Actually, I think I have three. Um, and maybe 
I'll ask the first one that I know is specifically for you, Heather. Um, in the and then the other two may be some overlap with our our staff as well. Um, so I can hold off. <laughs> um, so in terms of the the initial draft and the current numbers that in the allocations, I'm just trying to understand how you know where where the decision points were, how we and how the city of Santa Cruz ended up getting the, that additional. 530, I think it is somewhere around there, um, units. I, as I understand it, part of the change was about including additional uh, or increasing within our allocation the number of units that um, were allocated for the categories where we have not been meeting the goals. Um, in particular, in the very low and extremely low income categories, and to some extent low, although we did pretty well this past round um, overall relative to the the arena the goals. Um, so, where did like where did that come that extra 530 units come come from? I, because I imagine that the overall number didn't change in terms of the allocation for the for AMBAG jurisdictions. So. I'm, I'm trying to understand that. And then um, I also am interested in trying to understand where, um, you know, density bonus projects fit into these allocations. We have, um, as you, and you mentioned some of them, state laws that now allow for significantly higher density in areas that are, are zoned for, for lower density. And so are we, are, is the, I just can't get clear on the, the, the density bonus <laughs> units count towards our arena goals. I think they do. And I am trying to figure out how that fits into the overall question of where our, we're at with our general plan and whether our general plan can accommodate the increases. So, two, okay, well, two. I'll answer your first question. I can answer that one. Great. And I'll leave the second one for city staff. Okay. Okay. So um, over the last few months, um, well, let me start. Back in spring and summer, because there's a number of priority factors we can include, uh, we started with reviewing all the regions who have gone through a uh, six cycle before us and looked at their methodologies and looked at what they included in their methodology as priority factors. And big regions, little regions, all throughout the state, everyone did it a they have very similar components, but you can measure things different ways. And so we worked with our planning directors and um, board of directors in identifying what was important. And at that time, um, using expecting housing growth, um, it, uh, jobs, and looking at what already had, um, you know, somewhat frequent transit, either 15 or 30 minute frequent transit, because the idea was is you'd want to assign more housing unit where there already is transit that could support it uh, for infill. And then a resiliency factor came up um, as looking at a wildfire zones and high risk areas for sea level rise. Um, so at that time, this is over the summer, we kind of narrowed down the priority factors and then um, getting them to sort of assign a weight or ranking. Is this a high priority, medium, low. And so what we came, once we had a number <laughs> assigned to us, the 33,274 number in September, we could then apply, basically it's a formula, um, of these different components awaiting. And so beginning in September and October, we had some initial drafts um, that had the city of Santa Cruz an allocation estimate, because keep in mind, this is just an estimate. Um, until the draft plan comes out, um, was around 2,800 units or something like that for the city of Santa Cruz. Um, that was discussed, I believe that number was the one that was discussed at our November 10th board meeting. That's what we called our revised draft methodology. Um, we got a lot of feedback um, and asked to continue the discussion. That's when the board um, uh, took action to continue the uh, public hearing until a special December meeting and not take action. They provided some direction um, on additional factors to consider. And one of them was uh, using the affirmatively furthering fair housing 
um, as um, a, a factor. And the data that we used to that was a uh, racially concentrated areas of affluence. So we looked at those areas around the region and that looked at jurisdictions that were above 200% of the poverty level. Um, we looked at a regional average and then we looked at the jurisdiction average. And for those jurisdictions who met that, uh, were considered affluent. We also looked at racial uh, um, areas as part of this, where the concentrations of areas uh, percent white, and we took the regional average and those jurisdictions that were above that uh, met the, the initial categories. Um, initially, we had used this information just to shift the type of the unit. So if you were in this um, racially concentrated affluent area, you would get a higher percentage of very low and low units as compared to other areas that might get more moderate and above moderate. Feedback we got from um, both board members, some board members, as well as a lot of public uh, comments, uh, both in letters and um, at the public hearing itself, was we needed to do more and we needed to allocate units based on that, um, those racially concentrated affluent areas. At the same time, um, HCD staff reached out to us and asked to do an informal review of our methodology. And so we had submitted what we had presented at the November 10th meeting. Um, they came back and gave us some feedback and one of their key recommendations was, yes, you do need to include a allocation factor that will actually allocate more units to these racially concentrated affluent areas. And that's where the difference of what was presented initially at the November 10th board meeting of around the 28, 2900 versus what was presented at the planning directors yesterday that was closer to 3,400. And so that where the difference comes in is we added that new factor and reduced the weighting of another factor to accommodate that based on feedback. And um, that was presented yesterday. And if anyone is interested, email me but all the detailed spreadsheets and everything are available online at ambag.org <laughs> uh, in case you do want to review that. Um, but that's where we are in terms of um, sort of an allocation estimate. Um, and so we got more feedback yesterday. And so we are now preparing material for next week's board, special board meeting, and we'll be presenting that. But what I can say is all the alternatives that we've looked at, the different options that we looked at, have um, an allocation estimate for the city of Santa Cruz, probably anywhere from the 2800 to the 3600 area. So, um, and sort of that's where um, it is. And it's, it's much larger than your the cycle allocation, of course, um, but our, keep in mind, everything is larger because our determination was more than three times bigger. So, so yeah. So that's where the difference of the 500 came in. It's still a draft estimate and um, subject to change until the reader methodology is approved um, by the board, submitted to HCD, approved by HCD, finalized by the board, and a draft reader plan comes out. <laughs> um, but it is just something to um, give it a sort of an estimate of what jurisdictions are looking at. Thank you. So if I could just, um, just to make sure I'm, I'm understanding this. So what I think I'm hearing is that um, because of the changes in weighting of factors, it, it may be that different jurisdictions within the AMBAG purview will have different percentages relative to their population that may not correspond in the same way. Like my understanding is that it's generally been, you know, based on percentage of population and growth and they stay kind of somewhere around, I think it's like 8% or something, but um, because of the changes in weighting in the methodology, that's where we're getting the kind of, I don't want to call them disparities because we're talking about addressing some really significant disparities. And so I don't even want to compare, you know, disparity in allocations. Um, but is, is that, am I getting that? That it's that it's about the, some of the particulars of, of the, um, the character of the Santa Cruz housing stock and demographics. Yeah, so I mean, everything changed with six cycle. So what we did in the past 
is no longer an option. The state's not looking at it like that. They don't want regions to look at it like that. They don't want jurisdictions to look at it like that. And so, um, yeah, so everything's different. And um, because of the specific statutes, um, equity and um, affordable housing in affluent areas to provide opportunities um, maybe to those who hadn't had them in the past in higher resource areas is a huge priority of the state. And that is, you know, from our conversations with HCD and what we've seen of other methodologies is um, is really a key focus of that, what they're looking at. Thank you. Next, I have Vice Mayor Bruner. <clears throat> um, was, was Council Member Brown's second question answered? Yeah, I can, um, Sorry. I, I can say that. Answer that question, Council Member Brown, but I, I know we, I, have, we only have Heather for. I, yeah, I thought, yeah. yeah. Okay, so we'll, we'll circle back. This, yeah. I'll thank put you back in the queue, Council Member. Okay, Heather, thank you so much. It's nice to meet you. Um, that was um, very helpful. Uh, you spoke of uh, the method methodologies to promote fair housing and reduce income and racial segregation. Can you speak to that process here in the city of Santa Cruz? How, if you could just, what that process looks like? Well, um, it's new for tick cycle for each region and for the, in this right. case, AMBAG, to need to consider it as part of our methodology development. When each city, like the city of Santa Cruz, um, updates its housing element, it will have to go through its own process as well. And there's guidelines um, that the state has, has been developing and are on their website on how to do that. And so I don't wanna speak uh, for the city, but that is a conversation that, you know, I'm sure your planning department will be having with you soon, later tonight or beginning next year as you start to update your housing element because we're looking at it at an adaptation line but then the city is going to have to look at it. Okay, well, here's our number, our unit number that we need to um, update for our housing element. And then you need to look at it at the jurisdiction level. Okay. Um, okay. And then quick question on slide six. Um, Bonnie, is it possible to quickly go back to slide six? I believe slide six was the, um, the methodology, the factors. Okay. We're looking at, at the priority factors, I think that's what you're referring to. And um, there was like jobs, house, housing growth, or is it, is it, am I on the right? Yeah, you're on four, one more, five, six. There we go. There's. Um, the, okay the priority factors and okay. Thank you. My question has been answered. Thank you. Thank you. Vice okay. Is that it? Yes. Okay. And then we'll go now to let's see. Council member Cummings. Hey, Mayor. Uh, good to see you once again. Um, I had a, a number of my questions have been answered, and it's great to point out that, um, you know, a lot's changed since the last housing element, because I think for a number of the people that I've been hearing from, uh, that's been a, the concern is why are we seeing these huge disparities in numbers? And it sounds like um, the state's putting a lot more pressure, and well, one has changed the methodology and is really trying to put pressure on jurisdictions to provide this housing. I'm just curious, Curious though, I mean, it was, you know, a few months between, and kind of probably less than like a month and a half between what was brought forward um, at the most recent meeting with the planning directors and what we saw last time, and you know, having that 500 unit increase is pretty dramatic. And so, I'm just, and, and at the previous meeting, one of the things that I brought up was that 
you know, one of the thresholds they had used, um, I think it was around, I'm trying to look through um, the report, which was around, um, you know, being above the poverty level. And we were kind of like right there at 1%, being at 66% with the threshold being at 67. And then, um, you know, this new methodology, um, even though it was that 1%, we're now, you know, we now kind of went up 500 units in terms of um, the number of units that we need to provide. And so I'm just curious if you can speak to that a little bit, like, you know, with having two kind of methodologies recently come forward. I know you mentioned it a little bit, but I'm wondering if you can kind of um, get into a few more details around those two categories. One was poverty level, one was kind of uh, racial composition and how with just such a small percentage difference, we've now shot up, you know, so many units. And we see that change. I know like looking at Salinas, I think they went down about 2,000 units and there's been a lot of variation shifting in, in the number of units across the different jurisdictions. And so I'm just wondering if you can speak to that a little bit um, for clarity. Yeah, so the version that was presented at the November 10th board meeting and by board meeting did not have um, a component of a factor that considered uh, the racially concentrated areas of affluence or RCAA for short and to get at that afford affirmatively furthering fair housing issue as part of an allocation. So what was presented yesterday to the planning directors and the feedback we got from both the state and uh, public comment and from some board members was we need to include it as an allocation factor. So what we did previously, it was a very job, existing jobs focused methodology. And so uh, looking at where the jobs were um, and that was an 85% of um, basically 85% of roughly uh, a little more than half of the units. Um, we reduced that to 50%. So in order to accommodate a new um, um, allocation factor of the RCAAs. And so that was at 35%. The other thing we heard was there was two jurisdictions, as you mentioned, that um, qualified as uh, a racially either um, uh, affluent or racially concentrated, and but not both. And our previous definition had said you need to be both. And so we got comments that said it shouldn't be all or nothing. Um, you should consider those who meet one of the categories, which was the city of Santa Cruz and Sand City uh, down in Monterey County. And so we assigned that a, a, a partial. And so um, basically your allocation went down um, in the jobs factor in terms of the allocation of units but it was offset by a higher allocation at a partial um, RCAA allocation. And so um, it wasn't a full, um, if we had counted the city of Santa Cruz and San City as 100% of both racially uh, concentrated as well as affluent areas, um, it would have been much higher, but we had only allocated um, a partial um, uh, identification of that because you didn't meet the threshold for both of the categories, only one. And so um, your number did go up, um, uh, but um, it didn't go up as much as it could have if we didn't do that sort of sliding partial credit. Um, and I'm just curious because- I hope that, yeah, that does that, that answer your question? That helps, um, I'm just kind of curious, um, in terms of like the total numbers, because I think the intent was that um, many members of the public who had contacted me as the AMAC rep were concerned with the fact that we were getting less allocation towards very low and low and more allocation towards moderate and above moderate. But what we have is kind of overall an increase in the total amount of um, housing. And so, and then you also mentioned that you know, there's a potential that it's between, you know, kind of this 28 and 3,600 level. And so I'm just kind of curious as to what um, controls that, because I think a big concern is that, you know, within the city limits, we're pretty built out. And, you know, with SB 35 kind of saying, if you don't meet the development requirements, that then allows that law to kick in and really kind of eliminates local control over development. So the more units that are under the arena goals, the less, you know, the more likely 
SB 35 is going to kick in. And so I'm just kind of curious, you know, around kind of what drove those overall numbers up when I think the concern was that we were going to lose less prioritization towards the very low and low, um, especially since we've done really well with moderate and above moderate production. And we've met, I think, all except with the exception of our very low, we've been able to meet our arena goals. And this uh, proposal of 3,400 would really kind of limit our ability to, you know, be good housing producers and meet our arena goals. Yeah, to your comment about the change in the income categories, um, the feedback we got from both the board and the public and HDD was to add, um, you know, the AFFH as a category, um, as an allocation category. But we also got feedback from HDD that, you know, if you do add that as a priority category, you really should um, reduce the shifting of the um, the above moderate to very low and to um, moderate to low. And so that shift previously in the November 10th, that income category shift for those RCAAs areas were was 50%. So half of the units would be shifting if you fell into that area um, for both categories. Um, City of Santa Cruz would only be partial. The feedback we got from HDD was if you do add it as an allocation, unit allocation, then you should probably reduce the income shift. And so that's where um, your overall number in that proposal um, that was presented yesterday did go up, but the number of units in the very low and low were reduced and you're above moderate. Um, you have more of a percentage in above moderate to moderate. And so that's sort of um, the trade-off that, you know, those two options present. Um, but that was that particular change was based on direction given to us from HCD staff. Okay. Heather, I just want to be respectful. I don't know if you can answer this question very quickly, but um, do you have, this would be my, just my one question. Um, some of my other ones have been asked. Um, do you have any uh, lens into what the review process will be like with HCD? Is there any kind of guidance that they've produced or do you have any any sense? And then is it at a staff level or is there a commission associated with HCD that does this? I'm just not clear exactly. There, um, no, there are no guidelines set up um, for a six cycle review. This is new, but um, we are probably in the second half. Um, so they've indicated certain metrics that they look at and those are metrics that we've shared with the planning directors and board. Um, so, uh, yeah, it's, it's by HCD staff. It's not a commission level. There are no set guidelines or anything that's produced for this. And so, um, it's a 60 day review. And so we, um, it's a lot of data sharing. So uh, assuming the board does take action, you know, we'll need to prepare the submittal, uh, for HCD. Um, I've heard from other regions and HCD, there's, there's some back and forth and asking for additional data. Um, but um, we've been coordinating with them for the better part of most of this year so far in trying to gauge uh, this process. And obviously, you know, I work well if there's guidelines, with the other planning work we do has guidelines associated with it. And so this does not necessarily have those guidelines. And so um, it's, it's a little uncertain because um, the board technically could approve something and, you know, we may get pushback from HZ that says, no, nope, um, we want to see some additional modifications. And so um, that's why we were very strategic in starting with what they had approved for other regions as a starting point, um, because we, we knew that if they had approved other uh, methodologies for other regions, you know, we would be on a better footing uh, than starting from scratch. And do you know if they're, I mean, it, let's say that they kick something back and I mean, I don't envy your position. You're sitting on, you know, you're doing work for about for 16 different jurisdictions, and you're, and then you got your own board. Um, is there some kind of process that you know, or is it just back and forth? They send you a comment, you respond. You know, is it just, or or is it going to be like, um, you know, they look at everything, they give you their decision, uh, or is it sort of an iterative back and forth where you're going to have to be coming back to jurisdictions? It's just. I, it just seems like it, it's going to be really complicated to 
figure out how to react yeah, to this it, as the local it has government. Been, yeah, it has been complicated uh, so far, <laughs> and I expect it to continue to be complicated. Um, there is, uh, they have 60 days to do the uh, review of the draft methodology. Um, what we've seen is they provide a, a concurrence letter or documentation back to each region saying, yes, it meets this, blah, 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 blah. Then the region would then approve that as final methodology and issue the draft renal plan. Um, if that doesn't happen within 60, within 60 days, if they say, no, here's your flaws, um, I assume there would be some conversations before that official letter came out. Um, but if we couldn't resolve that, they would issue that letter. We would go back to our board and the planning directors for trying to address whatever concerns they identified. We would then submit another draft methodology and then they have 90 days for review. So we don't really wanna be in that situation because the further we go with the RENA development process, the methodology, the less time that each jurisdiction knows the RENA number. Um, I'm hoping we don't get there. I'm hoping that the, you know, we've uh, consulted with them along the way. They, um, uh, I, I can tell you that, it, you know, if we went back to the option that was considered um, and discussed at our November 10th board meeting, based on the feedback we got, I don't think that's really a viable option to go back to that methodology option because we heard feedback on how to approve it and what they wanted to see. And so we've kind of moved on from that. Um, so, you know, we're hoping that the board takes action next week. We bring back, uh, the other thing is once the draft RENA plan is released, each jurisdiction is able to appeal the RENA allocation and HCD is also able to appeal jurisdictions allocation. That's a change too. So, I mean, it's just gotten really complicated, so. <laughs> Sounds like it's a good way to not build any housing, ironically. <laughs> I know, I know, <laughs> I know. Wow, okay. Um, yeah, this is this sounds very cumbersome and, and and hard really for local jurisdictions to just try to, you know, to forecast. So, wow. Um, well, that's my, that, that, that was my question, just trying to get a lens into what, what this may be like. Um, uh, is there any other uh, council members with questions for Heather this evening? Seeing any hands up? Okay. Well, Heather, I think we got you out just in time. So thank you very much okay, for coming great. to me. Yeah, I would encourage anyone who's further interested and want to stay more engaged and even get maybe more, even more details in a presentation to attend our, our board meeting next next Wednesday, December 8th at 6. And I want to thank you all for your time and feel free to email me or contact me with any additional questions you may have. Okay. Thanks so much. Great. Thank you. And Matt, I think we bring this back to you. Is that correct? For additional Mayor, information? Yes. Uh, our senior planner, Catherine Donovan, has a brief presentation as well from staff. Uh, would you like to hear that now? Sure. Okay, great. She's gonna talk about our, uh, our, our current RENA status uh, with this fifth cycle and next steps going forward with the housing element coming up. And then I just wanna make sure Council Member Brown's question it's, uh, you know, gets addressed by either of you guys would be great. Thank you. Okay, I'm gonna try and share my screen now. You can see it, Catherine, it's, uh, it's on slide view. It's not on uh, full view. There you go, how's that? That is in notes view right now. Oh, we've got three screens going. So <laughs> <laughs> you're more uh, you're more talented than I. Well, I get three screens and none of them are doing it right. Okay. Okay. Settings. Oh, there you go. I don't know what I did, but it worked. Okay. <laughs> so good evening, Mayor and Council Members. I'm Catherine Donovan, Senior Planner with the Advanced Planning Division. And as Matt said, I'm here to give you a brief overview of the city's process or progress in meeting its fifth cycle reading, RENA, 
and what we're anticipating for the sixth cycle and the processing um, for updating the housing element. Um, this slide is extremely dense. Um, so let me just guide you through the really important numbers. If you look at the first green column, this is our fifth, our current cycle. That's our RENA allocation. And um, at the bottom, the total allocation is 747 units. The second green column on the far end is uh, what we have remaining to, to uh, meet our targets. And as you can see, we have 123 very low units. That's all we have left that we need to meet. The rest we've um, actually exceeded. And these numbers are um, up to 2020. They do not include uh, this year. I did a quick and dirty um, review of our housing this year and um, we have no large projects that will be bringing in any very low income units. So there's a couple of small projects, so we might get a, you know, a, a handful, but it wouldn't make any significant change. Um, and so this brings us to the SB 35 determination. And the way this process works is that we submit our annual housing element progress reports to HCD um, and at two points during the cycle, at the midpoint and at the end of the cycle, they uh, review our, our totals to date and they um, compare them to our RENA numbers and they see if we have met the proportionate amount. So at the midpoint, they see if we've met 50% of the targets for each category. And at the end, of course, they see if we met everything. Um, and if we don't meet our above moderate, um, then SB 35 is triggered for projects, for any project that meets the city's inclusionary requirement. Um, we have met our above moderate, so that does not apply to us. But if, the, if we don't, meet our proportionate share of both the low and the very low by mid-cycle, then SB 35 is triggered for any project that has 50% um, of lower income units. And lower income means low and, and below. Um, so any project coming in that has 50% lower income units uh, is under the SB 35 process. This is a second very dense slide. Um, and this shows the projects that are pending um, that, that have potentially have very low income units in them. And I only put in the larger projects because small numbers aren't gonna help us at this point. And, and we usually don't know about the small ones as much as we know about the larger ones. So as, we, as you can see, we have a number of projects in the pipeline that could bring us those 123 units that we need. Um, the question is whether these will actually come to fruition before the end of our fifth cycle. Um, and basically, I just wanted to show you this slide to show that there's definitely the potential that we could, we could do that. Um, I make no prediction on the timing because these types of projects can take a long time, particularly if they're using a variety of different funding sources, which is common with um, affordable housing projects. So um, we're, we're cautiously optimistic. So going into our sixth cycle, as, as you learned from that discussion with Heather, the numbers have increased significantly um, and our most the most recent draft that we saw which we've already discussed was that um, the numbers went from uh, 2800 or 2900 to 3400 and that's that's a lot of units particularly when you when you keep in mind that our current unit our current mina the total is 747 units and then 
the AMBAG board is meeting in December and could potentially approve the methodology. And you heard all that from, from Heather. Um, so our current housing element runs through the end of 2023. Um, and we're planning to release an RFP early next year um, to start on our sixth cycle housing element. And we need to get we need to get going on this, even if we don't have our arena numbers. We know they're gonna be big numbers. We know we're gonna to have to do a lot of analysis of our properties and um, it's, it's gonna take a lot of time. So the sooner we can get started, the better. We're not gonna wait till we get the arena. We're, we're gonna move ahead with this. And then the housing element itself, um, is being funded by our local early action planning grant, the LIB grant, and it will be due to the state to the state in December of 2023. And there are some recent um, legislative changes that have added uh, some sort of time-consuming processes to the housing element. So. Um, There's both more that has to be in the housing element and we have additional public review time frames that are, are mean that we have to get it out earlier. Um, so, so we're getting prepped for this. So in the housing element, um, we must be able to demonstrate that we have sufficient property that is zoned to provide the housing in our arena allocation. Um, in our fifth cycle, we were able to meet that, that um, allocation through our existing general plan land use, and we didn't have to make any land use changes. Um, but meeting this new cycle allocation is going to be challenging, and it may require um, general plan and zoning changes. Um, I, I was in a webinar today but put on by AMBAG, or I'm sorry, by ABAG, and they are one year ahead of our, our schedule. Um, and they were saying that um, it is now typical to do your zoning updates ahead of your uh, housing element because the changes in state law have given such a short time to, to do those zoning changes. And if you don't do them, it's basically um, as if AB, uh, as AB 35 is kicking in. So, so that's gonna be really important as we move forward on that. Um, the other thing that has changed with state law is that um, additional housing can be built without changing zoning, particularly in our low income, uh, sorry, our um, low density housing in our single family housing zoning. So um, the passage of a lot of the um, ADU ordinance changes and the passage of um, SB9 are gonna increase the number of units that we can uh, claim, but without crunching the numbers, we won't know I, I doubt very much if that is going to be enough on its own, but it's a help. And that is my presentation for tonight. And I'm happy to answer any questions. And if we wanted to start with um, Council Member Brown. Sure, thank you. That thank would be great. Yeah. Keeping me in the queue. Um, <clears throat> yeah, so I, I mean, I think your last statement sort of touched on the one of the questions that I had about our ability to use, since we don't know what developers are going to request in their density bonus projects, um, we can't really necessarily count on those units, but I'm, I'm just trying to, to figure out um, if as the city uh, sees it, you're including the possibility of maximum density 
where it's allowable um, under the density bonus as kind of part of the analysis uh, of whether or not we have we are um, our general plan could accommodate that kind of these kinds of numbers. I think we could we could propose that we would have to have a very strong and convincing argument um, on the last housing element. We went back and forth with HCD on our numbers a lot, and I was very conservative in how I calculated how many units we could provide. Um, and there was definitely pushback, even even with you know I had to explain every little thing that I was doing, and so I think. Actually, if we don't meet our low income, our very low income number, so that we are still subject to um, the SB 35, that actually might be a stronger argument. The problem is, of course, we won't know until after the housing element is due. So, um, you know, it's things like that. If we, if we could, if we could tell that we were not going to be able to meet that. And we just said, you know, we're going to be subject to SB 35. We know that they're going to do this, that, and the other thing. Um, then, and we know that we're going to have density bonus uh, applications. And so, therefore, um, that might be convincing. Um, they're, they're, it's, they're a hard sale. You know, they're, they're not easy. To, they're, they're not making it easy on us. They want to see that housing, and they're forceful about it. Yeah, I, I wouldn't anticipate, hi, council members, Lee Butler, the deputy city manager. I, I wouldn't anticipate the, that HCD counts um, uh, capacity associated with the density bonus towards mm -hmm. certifying our housing element. Um, that said, when um, density bonus projects come through, those units do count towards um, our current cycle and um, meeting those needs. But for for certifying that we've, for a certified housing element, showing that we've got that capacity, I, I wouldn't bank on HCD allowing that. Gotcha. So for planning, no, but reality, yes. if, if that's, if the reality works out. Okay, got it. Um, and then one other, just while, since I have the floor, and ask my other question. Um, where and I always wonder this, and I never remember to ask. Where does UCSC fit into the picture for our um, RENA allocations and what we count for meeting our commitments? There, um, kind of they not. sort of don't. Um, okay. You know that the the dormitory style housing does not count in the unit count. And um, so some housing provided by the university that's provided in apartment style housing can count towards the arena. And if, I mean, they've got their long range development plan. Yeah, I, it would be, I, I would not count on them. I would not count on, on that housing because there's just too many variables. I was going to add to that too and just say that staff and faculty housing can count towards arena as well. Uh, but yeah, like, like Catherine said, there's only certain styles of student housing that can count and certainly HD doesn't count dorm style housing as one of those. Right, the independent kitchens, I think that's one of the factors that could um, uh, make it, as, as Catherine was saying, the apartment style. So depending, there there may be some opportunities to count some of those, but in large part the dorm the dorms will not, and so the majority of the units will not. Right, and I don't know, you know, for the city it's based on the zoning. For the university, we'd have to check with HCD. It might be that they would allow us to count on their um, long range development plan, but. I'm not sure of that. Thank you. Thank you, council member. Uh, I'm just gonna do a time check. Um, we still have another item tonight. So it, I've got Shebra, Justin, and then Martina.
Thank you, Mayor. Thank you, Catherine, for the presentation. You answered one of my questions. Um, my other one is around, um, so if we if we don't meet the mid-cycle um, and then the end of our cycle with ARENA goals, um, clearly SB 35 and such policies kick in. Um, what are what are some other ramifications or impacts that we would experience? Like, would it preclude us from certain uh, grants to the state? Like, what are some of the other things that we're looking at? Yes, well, not, if we don't have our housing element approved, then that interferes with the the grants. It the not meeting the um, the targets does not interfere with the grants. Um, the biggest thing, I mean, I almost hate to say anything because it's it's been a moving target these last few years with the housing legislation. But um, the biggest thing is that. Um, is the SB 35, mm -hmm. and then um, getting getting the housing element itself approved, and if needed, getting any um, properties that we need rezoned in order to meet the amount of available property. Um, we have to do that within a year, and if we don't have it done within a year, and that's a year of, of our due date, so a year of the um, the due date is is in December of 2023. So if we haven't rezoned them by December of 2024, then it's basically as if um, SB 35 was kicking in. Everything is is by right and ministerial. All of our housing approvals and that lasts for the entire cycle. So mm -hmm. that's not a position we want to be in. Mm -hmm. I see. But, but not meeting the arena goal doesn't affect grant eligibility. It's the housing element that would affect right. eligibility. Right. right. And, and how about anything around um, transportation grants? Is that also impacted? Uh, no. And actually, the other thing that is an, uh, does have an impact is whether we do our progress reports. Um, so if we don't turn on our annual progress reports, then we're not eligible for a lot of the grant funding. Mm -hmm. But we're... We're always good about that, so. Thank you. I will add to the, the grant discussion. Uh, while it doesn't currently impact our, our grant funding, uh, HCD recently rolled out uh, a pro-housing designation, mm -hmm. uh, which cities can apply for. Uh, so they, they have a list of a number of, a number of ways to, to meet this designation. And uh, one of them is, is, uh, is providing uh, more RENA in, in our housing element, or you know, more units in our housing element than the than the arena, uh, the the arena number. Uh, so there is a way to get points through arena for for that pro housing designation, and we are starting to see state grant funding uh, be weighted on uh, whether cities have pro housing designations or not, uh, both both in transportation and public works grants and in planning grants. So I, I think that's something. Uh, the city could look into in the future uh, to be more competitive in future grant funding. Thank you so much. Thank you, Council Member, Council Member Watkins. I'll go to you next. Uh, thank you. Yeah, thank you for the presentation. I think most of my questions have been answered. The only question I had was in regards to the ADUs, because I know we were trying to really highlight, you know, by design affordability. Mm -hmm. Where? Where do they fall in, or in terms of the designations? Uh, they've kind of been all over the place because we've done those those surveys. Um, we've done we did some informal surveys, which I we, I um, got HCD said it was okay to do that, and then we've also done a, a formal survey two and a half years ago, and we just did one again this year. Um, and so when, when the surveys have shown that the uh, prices for ADUs are lower, um, we've been able to claim the ADUs on either our um, low or moderate income. But there was a couple of periods where we couldn't even do that. And I haven't tallied all of the responses we've gotten yet from our current survey, 
but they're not looking. I, I'm shocked at how much people are charging. Okay. Okay. Yeah. Okay. That's helpful to know. I appreciate that. Yeah. I know the intention was sort of by design. And then just sort of looking at the agenda report, I mean, it's kind of like dumbfounding how many jurisdictions don't meet anything close to the arena goals. And yes. um, just, yeah, I really want to acknowledge and thank you all for your work and how far we've come as a jurisdiction. You know, even though we didn't quite need it, I mean, we're much further ahead than a lot of jurisdictions. Anyway, thank I have you. to say that that big number that's coming up is really scary. That is really scary. Yeah, yeah. I agree. Thank you. And Councilmember Cummings. Thank you for the <clears throat> for the presentation. I have um, just one question. I'm kind of a little sad that our AMBAG um, staff person's gone, but I'm just wondering: um, is you know, in terms of HCD and just like the tracking of Rena and maybe the city's role in tracking our arena numbers. Is there any requirement that it's a net gain of housing? Because I would imagine that, you know, for in, in order to make space for more housing, there is a likelihood that you're gonna tear down some housing and, you know, in terms of affordable by design in the sense that like, if it's been here for a long period of time, the higher it's a higher likelihood that older housing is gonna be cheaper housing, right? And right. so I'm just wondering if we're tracking that at all in terms of, you know, yes. what we're losing in terms of older housing and how that influences our arena numbers. Um, we do track the housing that's being demolished and it is subtracted from our totals. Um, uh, there's, unless, you know, so, so housing that's, that's cheaper simply because it's older is it's just counted as, as above moderate, unless it has some, um, Unless there's a, a some kind of a deed restriction or an agreement for uh, for a lower income, um, and and we have replacement requirements for so if if uh, affordable housing is demolished, the housing that replaces it has to replace that affordable housing. So we don't we don't lose it as long as it's um, officially um, designated as long as there's a there's a uh, agreement for it, but if it's, but if it's just old and cheaper because it's old, we don't get any. Well, you know. in, in addition to it being indeed restricted, the state's replacement requirements for affordable housing also apply to if a tenant was in those, was in that unit also uh, <laughs> was, was lower income. Right. Uh, so, so that person may be um, you know, living in an older unit as well, uh, that would that would still apply to the replacement unit requirement. Thanks, Matt. I forgot that part. Yeah, just a follow-up to that. I'm just wondering, is there anything the city could do in terms of, because, you know, I mean, if there's an older unit that's, you know, being rented for lower, and like, let's say that the tenant isn't, you know, on a section of housing voucher or technically low income, I mean, I'm just wondering if there's a way, because I guess the reason why I ask is it's going to be really, I mean, we struggled to meet and we didn't quite meet, you know, producing the amount in this arena cycle. Yeah. And there's a potential that we're going to have to have, you know, close to four times as many units. And that's going to be really difficult to achieve, especially given our kind of geographic structure and being pretty built out already as it is. And so, you know, and I don't, this isn't a question that needs to be answered right now. And maybe we can like follow up with our legal counsel. But I think that, you know, it's something worth considering if there's ways that we can, you know, officially designate certain older housing um, and being able to incorporate the new housing that's built to replace that, you know, within our arena goals so that we don't, you know, count something that's actually being rented out affordable as, you know, market or, you know, moderate or above moderate. Um, and then the one other question that came up, so that that's more of a comment than a question, I would say. Um, and then um, the one question I do have, though, is that, you know, we, we still do have single family homes being uh, produced. And I'm just wondering, you know, in terms of new single family homes that are being built, does that kind of factor into our arena numbers as well? Or how are those? Um, it does, but you know, surprisingly, uh, so the quick and dirty look I took at this year's housing to date, we had, um, there were about 300 units that that permits were issued, 200 of them were for that, the 
um, Pacific Front Laurel project. Another approximately 80 were ADUs. And then there were a couple of multifamily projects that were maybe another 10 or 15 units, and there were about 10 single family homes. So this year particularly, we've always been, you know, ADUs have been a steady stream for us, but this year they really picked up. And I think that was kind of pandemic driven. People were home, they were saying, we want some more space. Um, yeah, and we do have, you know, that pipeline, that pipeline, um, uh, slide that I did. We have there. There's over a thousand units in that. Um, so there's there's a, and we have two more years to go in this cycle. Um, so I my prediction would be that we'll we'll get close to twelve hundred housing units built in this in the fifth cycle. The problem is they're not the low income that we need. And I guess the last question I have is, um, is there any way we could use Section 8? And maybe in, this is for you, anybody kind of in planning, but I'm just wondering, you know, if we have the provision of certain units going specifically, specifically to Section 8 programs, if that's a way for us to get to, you know, providing units for low-income people, because I mean, just, you know, building those units alone, it's like two hundred to 300,000 dollars, you know, to get government subsidies for low-income units. And without the government, you know, our state or federal government kind of giving us that money, you know, Section 8 is one way we can actually take people who are in those categories and put them in housing. But I don't know if that actually suffices uh, or is sufficient for us to meet our arena goals. So I'm wondering if maybe you could speak to that at all. Or if you have um, any there's, there's two different ways that Section 8, <clears throat> one is the individual Section 8 vouchers and there's a real shortage of those. So I wouldn't even, I, I've heard that there's a something like a 10 year waiting list in the county. But there's another process that is um, that this Section 8 projects, and I don't know much about them. Someone in our housing department could tell you more. Um, but that is another a funding source that is sometimes used in our affordable housing projects. Um, and that's that's about the extent of my knowledge. I know that it exists. I know that we have, that some of our, our projects have used them, um, but I don't know how difficult it is. I don't know what the, how easy it is to, to get one. Um, uh, this is Bonnie, Bonnie Lipscomb um, with Economic okay. Development. I, a number of the projects in the pipeline on the slide that uh, Catherine showed um, do include project-based vouchers as part of the funding mechanism, and you can count those as long as they're project-based vouchers for, um, for your arena goals. Thanks, Bonnie. And Council Member, if I, we still need to go to public comment, so I'm wondering if there's a way maybe we can, yeah, if you can follow up with staff individually maybe on some of those questions. Okay. I'm done. So, but thank you. Great. Um, I will go ahead and take this out to see if we have members of the community that would like to comment on this item, and then I can bring we can bring it back to council for further deliberation. Yes. So, if you are here to speak on this tonight, um, I do see a couple of hands up already. So that's great. Um, but if you are interested in uh, speaking to item number two, the regional housing needs allocation update. Now is the time to press star nine on your phone to raise your hand. When it is your time to speak, you will hear an announcement that you've been unmuted, and then we'll set the timer for two minutes. So if I don't see your name on your um, listed as you raise your hand, I'll, I'll call off the last four digits of your phone number. First up, I've had, I have Andy Schifrin. Can you hear me? Yes, we can. Okay, because I'm not calling in. I'm just, I just zoomed in. So I'm glad. Thank you. Um, my name is Andy Schifrin. I'm on the Planning Commission. Um, this matter of the arena numbers has not come to the Planning Commission yet, but I have had, I've had a chance to review the material presented to the council. I only have two issues that I want to talk about. First is the total number of allocated units to the city in the revised AMBAG memo. Um, there's been a lot of discussion already about that. 
I'm still unconvinced. The it's you change a couple of the assumptions, and all of a sudden the numbers change. And I do think that it's important for the city to push back on the um, on the on the increase in total units. The um, original number of units that the city got was about eight percent of the total which is about what the city's population is. Going to the 3,400, it gets up to 10% of the population. It would be in equal to about 10% of the unit. Um, I'm always a little suspicious of how when you have a lot of variables, just making a few tweaks here and there and all of a sudden everything changes. Um, as you know, already with the 2,870 units uh, compared to the current housing element, it's a, a, a very, very significant increase as has been, as you've been talking about, as the staff's been talking about. So I hope that the council and its representatives will really put a push on MBEG to um, reduce that number to back to where it was. Whether you'll succeed or not, I don't know. The process is so complex, um, who knows? My, but it leads me to my second point, which is that the overall RENA process is essentially an exercise in shaming. It cre in this round, it is creating a, a demand that is unmeetable. Mm. And I think that um, in a way it's done publicly, I mean, uh, consciously to try to force the city to do Force the, the uh, amount of development. Some of the indications about why it's unreasonable. One is that in the past, the city. Andy, I'm used, sorry. I just, if you could wrap up, I'm trying to trying to make sure everybody's got time tonight to speak. Thank you. Okay, let me just. There is a population forecast, and the total allocation is just too much. There's never going to be the subsidy to provide the unit, the very low income units. It's going to be a you know, hundreds of millions of dollars. And all this is is an exercise in getting the, setting the city up for failure. So I think it's important to recognize that. Thank you. Thank you. Okay, I'll go to phone number ending in 2174. A star six to unmute yourself. Phone number ending in 2174. If you could unmute yourself, please, by pressing star six. Can you hear me? Yes, we can. Okay, good. For a while you couldn't. Um, thank you, Gillian Greensite. Um, well, this is quite um, shocking and it feels very unreasonable and it seems very. Uh, uh, lacking in skill on the part of AMBAG. Uh, I'm new to, relatively new to this. I don't know if um, also looked at is the caring capacity of our schools, our hospitals, our police, our fire. Just to take housing numbers without a context seems very unwise. I hope you will push back. I'm sorry that um, Ms. Adamson left. I have a question. Um, and this is perhaps one of the assumptions that Mr. Shifrin was mentioning. Uh, if I heard it correctly, the overcrowded category was three people with two bedrooms. Now, to me, that's absurd. I know families come in groups in different configurations, but two parents and a child, that's two bedrooms, is not um, overcrowded. So six people with two bedrooms, now we're talking. So I think some of these categories should be really examined and peeled back and confronted. I don't know how the wealthy um, category was judged. Uh, we have a lot of people, I'd be one of them, who is not well off, but is in a house that the value is you know, ridiculously high, has nothing to do with my income level. And there's a lot of people like that in Santa Cruz will be gone soon. Anyone who buys a house recently is by definition well off. So those categories definitely need to be looked at. And if it was all extremely low or very low income, now we're talking. 
But when you bring in market rate housing, or even moderate rate, that creates the need for more low-income service workers. That's been well documented. Where are they going to live? So please push back on this. It's unreasonable. Thank you. Thank you. Next, we have phone, num phone number ending in 4965. Hi. Hi there, we can hear you. Hi, um, yes, my name is Candace Brown, and uh, I um, I did attend one of the NBAC meetings, and there was a lot of dialogue. Sorry, my dog is playing in the background. Um, there was a lot of dialogue about the methodology, and there's been a lot of new factors and parameters put in this, which has brought to bear this very large number compared to last time. You can't even really almost compare the methodologies. So you really need to dig into the methodology to see as the previous callers alluded to, um, to see if it's reasonable. When Governor Newsom talked about 3.5 million housing units, it's a very flawed analysis, and yet it's not been widely publicized because it was offered by the governor. McKenzie study said 3.5 million, USC said 2.8, UCD said 1.8, and LAO said a million. So I would be curious to know even the baseline to uh, what was the baseline number from which they then spread this out to the different jurisdictions because some of these um, studies and original premises were found to be very flawed. Also, I'm very curious about the fact that we're 30% students and there's no analysis that takes into account our demographics there because many people that are students don't necessarily need a kitchen. They can live in a dorm-like setting and it would be far more affordable. Uh, we also have a very large tourist population with hotels. I would be curious to know how that plays into it and whether somehow some of those housing units could be uh, considered housing units. Um, I know there's some hotels that do have kitchens and, and students, in fact, are living in them. So I think there's areas where there's a lot of housing being offered, but it's not sort of based on the analysis by ANDAG, and I, I hope that that would be brought to bear into consideration. And also it's very disconcerting to consider that UCSC may not be considered almost at all with 45% population increase. So we have huge impacts right now in our city and you know, how we can accommodate that is a great concern. Transportation, water, and infrastructure in particular. Thanks, bye-bye. Thank you. Next I have Kyle Kelly. Hey all, thank you so much, uh, Mayor, Vice Mayor, Council Members, this is Kyle Kelly. Um, sorry, I just want to point out for this process, the, the arena process and the allocation itself is, is regional. So any amount that, that gets contested uh, will go to a different uh, jurisdiction. So you kind of have, depending on how you view it, it can be mutually assured destruction. Um, I think it's great for us to get more housing. We shouldn't be demanding that Watsonville and Salinas uh, build the housing and require that people commute in. And I think it's worth noting from the American Community Survey um, from just a few years ago that nearly 20,000 people commute from Watsonville to Santa Cruz to work. Um, we're not even building 20,000 units. Um, and I personally think we should make room for the people that do work in Santa Cruz. Um, and so that's, that's an important thing to think about beyond just the overcrowded conditions. And I say this as somebody that has a family of five. We lived in a two-bedroom apartment. Um, it meant that some of us actually had to live in the living room uh, because that was that was what was available. We couldn't necessarily find family-sized apartments. So, you know, as somebody that has faced these issues and, and knows how it ends up affecting a lot of people kind of across the region, I, I, I want everybody to think about, like, who, who it affects and, and that, you know, we are actually affecting a lot of other areas within our region. Um, and I think you'll find that, you know, if, if we go through the appeals process, like like folks did with, with ABAG, um, you know, basically everybody gets to vote on it within, within AMBAG um, to, to find out if, uh, you know, if, if one city's jurisdiction can be appealed. Um, so that's, that's probably what, it, what is ahead of you here. Um, but I do want you to think about, you know, are we gonna do our part within the region and, and what is it gonna look like to the other jurisdictions? Um, thank you. 
Thank you. Next, I have Elizabeth Conlon. Good evening, everyone. This is Elizabeth. Um, I just want to challenge the notion that was brought up that we are built out. Um, from my personal experience, I can share that I live in an apartment complex with eight one bedrooms. Um, this is next to a one story single family house. So if we allow more small apartment buildings like mine, we could easily house 10 people like the number of people who live in my apartment complex instead of the four people who live next door. I also think that while the arena floors may be kind of scary, I think it's a really good opportunity to make progress on our climate goals. Um, I'm really shocked reading housing forums where people are desperately searching for housing in the region. And there are folks who work here, who study here, who are commuting from places like Salinas. And we have a real opportunity to take those cars off the road, um, as well as the equity um, issues that Kyle brought up. So. Um, yeah, appreciate your time. Thank you. Thank you. Is there anyone else in the audience tonight that would like to speak to the council on this item? Now would be the time to raise your hand. Uh, you can do that by pressing star nine on the phone. And I will look for your hand to go up. This will be the last call on this item. Okay. Okay, I'll bring it back to the council on this item. And tonight, um, the recommendation is that the uh, regional housing needs allocation report is uh, accepted. And it sounds like there's will be more work to do as we move ahead. Um, but this is meant to be sort of a, you know, an update report. So I'd look for a motion from council. Councilmember Cummings. Yeah, I'm happy to um, accept the report. Um, I will just, I just want to make a few comments though, which is, you know, I, I share with the public that, you know, I'm very concerned with the fact that you know, we struggle to meet our arena goals to get to 744 units across all those categories and now to get to 3,400 units is going to be really challenging. And so I agree that, um, you know, we need to push back against that. Um, because it, it seems like it's gonna be not only difficult to reach, but then it's gonna take a lot of our local control away. Um, it'd be good for us to track the affordability by design units because our staff kind of implied and kind of what we heard was that although some are built by, to be affordable by design, um, they're actually not guaranteed to be affordable. And it sounds like many of them are not actually, you know, when they're rented out, they're not being rented out at affordable rates. So that's something that I think that we need to track moving forward. Um, the city should also consider um, ways to, you know, um, make sure that we're meeting our affordability goals. I think we discussed that around, you know, if we're tearing down units that are being rented and affordable, if there's ways to put um, provisions in place to kind of track that. And also considering include, increasing our inclusionary percentage uh, by using Section 8 provisions to help us address the low and very low housing income needs. Um, while also providing developers with market rate rents. And um, I've spoken to a few developers who expressed that that's something that they might be interested in considering. Um, and then lastly, you know, and this goes to the point that, that was just made by, I think, the last two callers, you know, um, we need to produce, and it would be great if we could produce more of this affordable housing, but I think the biggest constraint is how are we going to fund that? And given that the state has a $31 billion surplus, the city should consider writing a letter to the state to demand that the state provides funding for cities to help them meet these very low and low goals. Um, you know, cities shouldn't be penalized by the fact that we're trying to meet these goals, um, but we don't have any funding to meet them. And, um, you know, the, the most difficult housing to create is very low and low income housing. So um, I think that moving forward, you know, saying to the state that while we recognize the need to produce housing, you know, with very low and low being the most difficult to create, if they're going to put these constraints on us, they should also provide us with the resources to meet these goals. So those are the comments I just wanted to share, um, but I'm happy to move the, um, to accept the report from AMBAG and, um, and I'm happy to also take comments. Um, I've been taking a lot of notes throughout the meeting and, and we'll be sharing them as the AMBAG representative when moving forward um, to the next AMBAG meeting. I'll go ahead and second that. Oh, go ahead, Vice Mayor. You have a second for that? Okay. 
Right. I was going to second that motion to accept Perfect. the report. Okay, great. Um, I do, I just so, so that maybe the public just is aware, I know that we've had some pretty good success recently um, with some of the affordable housing um, competitive, uh, competitive grants in the state. So, um, you know, hopefully we can keep that up. Um, I know that we did get Pacific Station South fully funded, um, including about 22.9 uh, million dollars worth of funding, and hopefully we'll we'll hopefully see some additional um, support. So, I just want to recognize our staff that what is available we are aggressively going after, and they are are reaching a lot of great success. So, um, just so the public knows that that. Our staff uh, is meeting with a lot of really good success with some of the state's funding that is available um, to getting to those uh, very low income units. So, well, um, just want to thank the planning staff, Catherine and Matt, and uh, for your time tonight. And we really appreciate the thorough report and the discussion. And um, we'll move on to our next item, which is uh, uh, Mayor, we can take a vote on that. Oh, I'm sorry. Yes, roll call vote, please. Can I just confirm, did you go with Vice Mayor Bruner on the second? I did, yeah. I'm going to have her be the second. Yes. Okay. Council members Watkins? Aye. Calentari Johnson? Aye. Brown? Aye. Cumming? Aye. Council member Golder is last. Um, Vice Mayor Bruner? Aye. And Mayor Myers. Aye. That motion passes 6-4 and uh, with Council Member Golder being absent. Okay, we'll move on to our next agenda item, which is agenda item number three, objective development standards for multifamily housing community review draft study session. For members of the public who are streaming this meeting, if this is an item you want to comment on, now is the time to call in using the instructions on your screen. Okay, um, we will have a brief presentation by staff on this, and then uh, council will uh, ask whatever questions of staff. I'll take it out to public comment, and then we'll come back and deliberate. So I'll turn this over to Sarah Noisy and um, Matt Benoit. Great. Good evening, council members, mayor. Um, my name is Sarah Noisy. I am a senior planner in the advanced planning division, and I am joined this evening by um, our consultant team that has been working with us on this project to develop objective design standards for multifamily housing. Um, so I'm just going to share my screen and we can get started. Can everyone see that? Yes, we can, Sarah. Great. Whoops. No. Let's see it over there. Okay. Um, okay, so my name's Sarah. I'm being going to be joined tonight by Meredith Rupp and Kristen Hall, who um, have been working with us on this um, on this project for the past year. We're going to go over some project background. We're going to walk you through our community engagement that we've um, done on this project. You know, Mayor, you said we would have a brief staff presentation. I'm going to do my best, but there is we have a lot of stuff to cover. It's been a big yeah. project, and we have a lot to talk about. And I'm just I'm actually really excited to tell you about all the work that we've been doing. Yeah, you're right, Sarah. I, I did look at everything, and you're right. I, sh I should say that we have a very thorough uh, staff report and presentation. Yeah, I mean, I, we're going to try We're gonna try and keep it to, you know, between 30 and 45 minutes, but um, it's a lot of work. We're going to keep but, moving. Yeah, that's great. Excellent. So um, after we go over the community engagement that we've done so far, we're going to, um, the consultants are going to talk through some of the key terms that are, you know, you need to be able to use the names for these various different features of zoning um, to be able to understand the standards that we've written. And then they're gonna talk through some of the development standards that we've um, created as a, in response to the preferences, the requirements of the state law and the preferences of the community. Then I'm gonna talk about the mixed use zone districts that we'll need to create. Um, we'll have a section about the amendment to the general plan that we're considering and, and some changes to the way we process permits and some other policy issues that have come up through the course of this project. We'll talk about how we're working on refining the standards at this point in the process, and then we'll go through some next steps. So first, project background. Um, you may recall that in uh, 2012, the city adopted the 2030 general plan. Um, 
our zoning ordinance does not fully implement that general plan for sites that are designated for mixed use. So um, at the end of 2019, our staff pursued a grant from the SB2 grant funding source to create some objective design standards to um, provide uh, standards for multifamily housing. We were doing this in response to a change in state law, which was the passage of the Housing Crisis Act of 2019, which says that we must use objective standards to um, review multifamily housing development proposals when they're submitted. Um, the standards have to allow for the planned capacity to be fully realized on um, parcels throughout the city. Uh, and it contains language that the, the um, cities shall not reduce the intensity of land use. And then reductions of intensity include, that means reductions to height, density, floor area ratio, which is a site standard, lot coverage, increases in setbacks, increases in open space or minimum parcel size, anything that would lessen the intensity of housing. And it takes us back to um, where things were as of January 1, 2018. So we're working with the general plan that we have in place at this point. As everyone here, I, I imagine, is, is well aware, SB 35 also is a factor here, which allows us to only use objective design standards. So when we're subject to, when we're reviewing an SB 35 development proposal, we're only allowed to use our objective development standards. So under the Housing Crisis Act of 2019, we can use subjective zoning standards. We just can't use them to reduce the intensity of the development, but we can still kind of apply some of these standards that are a little bit more subjective as long as they, as long as we maintain the development capacity of the property. Um, and then on top of all of these, as, as has come up earlier this evening, the density bonus law does still apply. I mean, that is still part of the reality. We are gonna write some objective zoning standards and in the case of density bonus projects, the way they hit the ground is gonna look, could look a little different. So an objective standard is something that can be um, known ahead of time and measured relative to an exterior standard. So um, typically they're illustrated graphically. So I have an example here that's um, to an objective standard that comes from our um, downtown plan that's showing you know, a minimum 40% of the frontage or um, not to exceed 50 feet. And then there has to be a break in the building facade and um, you know, the top floor can't be more than 60% of the floor below it. And all of those just kind of push on the building envelope that that's allowed to be built. And it's done in a really objective, measurable way. So it's easy for developers to understand if they're meeting the standard. It's easy for staff and decision makers to review if the standards are being met. And in theory, the public can then also understand what could be built on a parcel. So, so far on community engagement, we, um, started sort of kicked off this process doing a bunch of analysis and you know sort of analyzing our existing site standards in the zoning and the general plan and as part of that what fed into that analysis was talking with a group of developers about you know how they've been experiencing working with our zoning standards and general plan then in uh, spring of last year we had um, a webinar called designing santa cruz for all that really gave us this wonderful opportunity to talk with the community about a lot of the history of housing policy, why we might need objective standards, what the goals are for the state with all of the housing policy that's coming down. Um, and a lot of the history of like, what has given us the land use patterns that we are living in today, um, you know, sort of what's the history behind that. I'm gonna walk through a couple of those slides in a minute. Then we spent um, the summer in June and July doing um, a survey to define this community character. And then we held um, some focus groups later in the summer to sort of fill in some of the gaps that we had in the um, survey responses that we had gotten. So when we were when we did our designing Santa Cruz for All presentation, um, we wanted to provide the community with some historic context for our current housing policies. And essentially what we what we wanted to get into was that um, zoning was really a tool for racial and economic segregation when it was originally created. And we had um, guest speakers that came to our, that attended this webinar and presented with us, Gretchen Regenhart of the um, California Rural Legal Aid and um, Diana Alfaro of Mid Penn Housing came to talk about you know, what's the history of housing and what's been the ramifications of that, both on economic stratification, as well as racial, racial segregation and concentration, which is something that you know just came up in the, arena discussion. Um, and then we also sort of connected that to, to the recent bills we've been having from the state in regards to housing. So, you know, we also kind of talked about what's, you know, a the full spectrum of housing policy involves protection of existing of, of tenants. So that's things like eviction moratoriums, um, fair housing law and housing vouchers. Those apply to people and protect people in housing. There's preservation, which is the issue that um, uh, Council Member Cummings was just getting about at, about like how do we keep sort of existing lower 
like lower cost market rate housing on the market when you know there's all this incentive for redevelopment so things like in affordability restrictions inclusionary policies unit replacement unit legalization kind of helps keep housing on the market and preserve some of that existing stock and then production is also a component of good housing policy and that's things like zoning and permit streamlining and density bonus and the arena process and this project is related to production and zoning the idea with um creating objective standards and limiting our um, jurisdictions to, to objective, using objective standards to review development um, is that it, this will streamline the process and, in, and increase housing production. And so um, we just have some facts here about the estimated, um, you know, number of housing units that might be needed statewide. And, um, you know, there, there are various estimates of that number and, um, However you calculate them, California ranks 49th in the nation in terms of housing units per capita. And there is some connection between the number of units that are available and the how easy it is for any individual to find housing that they can afford. So further on in this in this presentation, when we had our guest speakers come to talk, they talked about um, you know, racial deed restrictions. This, these exist on housing units all, all over Santa Cruz County. This one comes specifically from Rispin Mansion in Capitola. Um, and zoning can start to address can start to address racism racism it was created with sort of some racist intentions to segregate people based on income which then income was inherently tied to race and um it's left us with these patterns so the map that you see here um, on the right is one dot per person broken down by racial category so there are blue dots that show where white people live there are um, green dots that show where our african-american black population lives and then there are um, orange dots for people who identify as Asian and um, orange, or I'm sorry, red dots for folks who identify as Asian and orange dots for folks who identify as um, Hispanic or Latino. And um, you can kind of see how those dots, especially those Latino dots are really concentrated in a few neighborhoods. And then um, the those blue dots are representing the Caucasian population are really spread out throughout our single family homes um, throughout the city. So um, essentially, by adjusting our zoning code, we can reduce discretion and reduce opportunities for discrimination. If we can produce more multifamily housing units, jurisdictions can create more opportunities for a wider range of income levels to live in those high opportunity areas. And um, you know, all of this is intended to make our housing process more fair and to create a more level playing field. Ideally, this also makes it easier for affordable housing developers who are gonna create those you know, deed restricted income qualified units that are going to stay permanently affordable gives them a more even playing field by creating some more certainty because those affordable housing developers just have a harder time dealing with uncertainty in a process. They don't have as much um, capital or capacity to sort of weather the that appeals and you know long processes and stuff. Um, I skipped that one for now. So the state has been working on legislating housing equity. Theoretically, state passes a law, it gets implemented through a city program, and that leads to an increase in housing supply. I'm sorry, my dog is um, knocking on the door. <laughs> Apologies. And um, and the state is really getting involved in enforcing these state laws. So, um, you know, you may have heard by now that um, the, the budget is really, that the governor passed, uh, is really focused on holding cities accountable for providing their fair share of housing, as it says right there at the top. And then um, just, I think maybe a week or two ago, um, our attorney general tweeted out the creation of this housing strike force that is really focused in the AG's office on um, ensuring that state cities and jurisdictions, cities and counties are following the law and you know processing applications in the manner that they expect them to be processed. So, um, as I mentioned earlier, we like one of the primary components for defining community character uh, um, that we used was a survey. We got um, over 800 responses. A total of 40 of those were in Spanish. Um, we got the feedback that we received really showed a desire for active ground floor uses and spaces. We had kind of mixed feedback on exactly what um, uses we wanted to see on the ground floor because there was both a lot of support in this in the um, survey and in the focus groups on 
creating ground floor commercial areas that can serve neighborhoods, but then also um, a fair amount of support for allowing residential only buildings to be built in commercial zones. Um, folks wanted to see wider sidewalks, better pedestrian environments, and then outdoor amenities, open space, landscaping. Um, there was also demonstrated some, some support for making rental housing more feasible, which usually involves things that make housing a little bit cheaper to construct. Housing, uh, rental housing is typically a little bit harder to make pencil out, at least in our current market. Um, and then a preference for architectural freedom, variety, eclecticism. I'm going to go through a couple of the um, a couple of the responses. You have this the full set of responses, I think, in your packet. It's on our website if um, anyone wants to look look through it from the public. So um, we asked a question about how much retail space do you want to see, and we got you know a whole host of answers. Most of them were that there should be somewhere, you know, some buildings to most buildings should have some kind of commercial activity. That was about half the answers. And then there was another 34% in that green category that said they wanted to see some kind of activity on the ground floor, but it didn't necessarily have to be commercial activities, so shops or restaurants. Um, so that's, you'll see that reflected in the standards that we wrote. Um, what's most important for new housing to, or new buildings to in, on, on these, um, I'm sorry, on the primary corridors, so on Soquel, on Water Street, on Ocean, on Mission Street, <clears throat> we asked a question about what's most important for buildings in those areas to include, even if they do increase housing costs. So like, you know, where are we really kind of drawing the line about like, we really want, won't accept anything less than this. And the most commonly selected answers were architectural details and then ground floor shops and restaurants. So that just kind of gets to this idea that we want to see architectural features. We don't want just, you know, flat, really contemporary looking buildings that came through pretty clearly in our focus groups as well. Um, and we wanna have activity at the ground floor, especially on these like primary commercial corridors. Um, and then this, these questions both kind of relate to what type of architecture is Santa Cruz interested in seeing. And I thought this was really striking. This pie graph on the left um, asks about, you know, do you prefer a more uniform look or a more eclectic mix? And as you can see, we had two thirds of our answers said that they preferred a much a more eclectic mix of architecture. And then um, on the right, some of this text is a little hard to see, but the, um, the blue bars uh, indicate a selection. So we have um, you know, various pieces here of features of a building. So building materials, building colors, breaks in, in walls, so variation in walls, um, changes in the roof shape, building decoration, landscaping or building entries. And the blue bars show um, the option that selected to um, you know, create some options for architects to choose from. The red bars are the option to um, you know, leave it just completely open and not set a standard, let the architects decide. And then the green bars are having the city dictate a really tight standard. And I think that's interesting that in all of these, the green bars are the smallest. Um, you know, it sounded like our community was really interested in creating a palette of options or just leaving things open for architects to decide about. And then lastly, um, I wanna talk about heights. We'll talk about this more a little bit later, but um, we, we asked a question about, you know, for buildings on these major corridors, again, where we have a mix of market rate and affordable units, what's the maximum height that you'd support in those areas? We know from our analysis at the beginning of the project that we needed a minimum of four stories, especially on, on to, for those sites that are on Soquel and Water and Branson 40 that have that higher um, mixed use high density land use designation in the general plan. We're going to need more height than is currently allowed in our zoning code. So we wanted to add, we wanted to ask this question. We know we need a minimum of four stories in those locations. And you know, kind of how do you feel about this? And I thought this was really interesting because, you know, 27%, so the, the largest chunk did choose four stories, which is you know kind of something I'd expect. I was surprised to see how many folks chose something larger than four. So five stories is shown in red, six stories is shown in green, no maximum height is shown there in purple. So that was like over 60% of our um respondents or right around 60% of our respondents chose, um, you know, something larger than what we needed, a taller height. And then similarly, this bar graph on the right shows, you know, sort of trade-offs for less expensive housing. Um, the most frequently selected answer was increased building heights. So um, this tells me that there is a diversity of opinion around height in our community. It's definitely a topic that I'm sure we'll continue to hear about. Um, but I just think it's worth noting that there, we do have a lot of folks in our community that are ready to accept taller buildings. 
So after we did the focus group, after we did the survey, part of what we did in the survey is we collected demographic data. One of our goals for this process was to really incorporate equity as a goal for the outcome and a goal for the process. And so we select, we um, collected demographic data and then we checked to see if we were hearing from a representative cross-section of the community and where we saw kind of gaps in the survey demographics we, we went out and pursued um, a focus group with those populations to ensure that those voices got included and represented in this process. So we looked at who was missing from that process. And then also based on where we expect most of the new housing development to happen, who was, who, and so where is it located? And then who's likely to be affected by that new housing? So then we ended up, so th that was kind of the thought process that we went through and we ended up having, holding a total of six focus groups last summer, and then we also conducted two interviews. We met with groups of students, a group of young adults, so adults under 35, under 35. Um, uh, we had a meeting with the Chicanx and Latinx community, with a group of low-income households, a group of renters, and a group of um, residents east of the river. The themes that came out of those focus groups were pretty similar to the themes that we heard in the survey. So there were strong opinions about architecture and that really a strong preference for this eclectic mix and sort of a dislike of very contemporary, modern, flat and unarticulated buildings. Um, really strong preference for architectural features, but not necessarily any anything like we want to, we want, you know, like Santa Barbara is like everything is Spanish colonial. There wasn't anything that was strongly like that, just this variety and the, the idea that there's detail. We got feedback about, um, you know, actually living in these new units. So like creating housing that's like a wonderful home to have and place to be. And that was thinking about things like security, access to sunlight and having private open space, access to private open space. Um, there were some sentiment in a couple of our focus groups that came up that objected, objections to building height and shadows um, are being used to constrain housing stock. Um, I was surprised to hear that in more than one of our um, focus groups. So. I think that's worth noting. Very loud and clearly from all six of the groups, we heard the priorities of affordability in housing, livable and newer housing stock, um, neighborhood serving commercial uses, things that people can walk to and actually want to use and, and live near, um, environmental sustainability for buildings. Um, so everything from the building material to the way the site is laid out, to the type of lighting that's used, to incorporating more trees and landscaping, support for um, walking and biking for all types of users. So that's as wider sidewalks. This is more accommodation for um, for um, non-automotive transportation options. And then landscaping trees and access to nature were really important for our community. And now I'm gonna hand it off to uh, Meredith and Kristen to talk through some of the key terms and some of the standards that we wrote in response to all of that great feedback. Thanks, Sarah. Uh, Kristen, you're up to tell us our key terms, I believe. Um, can everybody hear me okay? Yep. Yes, we can hear you. Thanks. Um, if you'll go to the next slide, please. Oh. <laughs> so, uh, you know, this is all, um, the standards themselves are quite technical, and there's a number of terms in, that we use throughout the standards as a way to describe common elements of buildings. And we wanted to just take a minute to talk through what some of these standard terms are that we use throughout the document, just so that everybody can kind of be on the same page with how they work and what we're talking about. So the first one is um, building envelope. And so a building envelope you can see in the image here is sort of a three-dimensional invisible envelope in which a new building can be built. So it doesn't actually represent the development size or intensity, but it does represent the kind of maximum extent that a building could take up. So the maximum height or um, how far it can co come close to the property line. But you can imagine a smaller building fits within this envelope, which is guided by the next slide, the FAR. So FAR, floor area ratio, is a way that we um, measure development intensity or density. So it's literally a ratio of the amount of de development that's allowed in square feet of building divided by the amount of land. So there's 
three examples here. If you take the middle one, that's the easiest. It's 1.0 FAR. On the very right-hand side of the middle graphic, you can see if you built um, an entire lot with one story, that's an FAR of one. Similarly, if you stack that up um, with two stories, that's you're only taking up half the lot, you're going twice as high, it's still an FAR of one. And if you were to stack that up over four stories, which is in the middle here, that's still an FAR of one, but you're building a four-story building on a quarter of the lot. So you can kind of see how this works out. If you go down to an FAR of 0.5, it's half the lot with one story. If you go up to an FAR of two, it's uh, two stories on an entire lot. So this is a way that we think about measuring density, and this is indeed what the general plan uses to measure density. So to put this together with building envelope on the next slide, um, this is a, from a test fit that we did looking at a site at Soquel and Water. And this is a building that has a 2.75 FAR, and it's representative of what an actual building massing might be on this site. So you can see the red dashed line represents the envelope, which is the maximum extent that the building can go up in height, which is 45 feet in this case. And you can see 2.75 FAR with parking and with courtyards inside of a residential building so that all the units have windows. We get up to four stories almost entirely, but not quite. So this is just a way of kind of explaining how density works together with building envelope, that the envelope is kind of a loose fit for that density to fit inside of. On the next slide, um, the next term is a setback. So the setback is the distance between the property line and a building. And this is a section view. So we're looking kind of vertically at the face of a building. Uh, on the right is a, a kind of a larger new multifamily building. And on the left is maybe a smaller single family building. And you can see if these were rear yard to rear yard, this would be a 10 foot setback from the rear property line. On the next slide, um, just to complicate matters, there's another thing called a step back, which sounds very similar to step back, but it's, it's at the upper floors, you can have the building mass is, uh, it's an additional setback that's applied just to the upper floors. So what happens here is a sense that the upper part of the building is sort of tapered relative to the smaller part of the building. And your experience of the building is that it's got a, a reduced bulk um, from that single family home, for example. On the next slide, um, there's two words that we use to describe the way that buildings meet streets. The first is the frontage which is the total length of the building um, from tip to tip. And then there's building faces, which are these individual walls that form a kind of a modulated appearance of the building. So you can see here in different shades of orange, we're showing different building faces. And while in some cases we describe a maximum building frontage length or things that must apply to a building frontage, we also talk about faces and how to kind of use those to break down the size of the building to make it seem more human scale. On the next slide, um, so this term modulation I just used, modulation is about variations across the entire building frontage that are large enough to create new pockets of indoor and outdoor space, and they extend from the ground all the way up to the roof, and they create multiple building faces. So on the top, you can see this is an example in red where you can see outlined, there's these building faces that kind of project in and set back. These are what we would consider building modulation because they go from the ground all the way up to the top and create multiple building faces. Below that, you can see there's just these kind of small projections of bay windows that don't project, that, that don't go all the way from the ground up to the top. So we wouldn't consider this as kind of building modulation. On the next slide, okay, so roof line also relates to building modulation. So roof line is the variations in the shape and the height of the roof that help break down the bulk of the building visually. Um, so on the top, you can see there's a kind of this staggered roof line that goes up and down and it's broken up and it helps create a feeling that the building is not quite as bulky towards the top. And you can see that these different roof lines relate to the modulation of these building faces. On the image below, this is a building that doesn't have a varied roof line. It's just got kind of a flat roof. 
and it doesn't have a sense of kind of breaking down that bulk into multiple faces. And just as reference, these are images that we actually used in focus group and got feedback on. And um, the one on the top is one that people responded positively to, and the one on the bottom is one that people fairly universally did not respond positively to because it has this kind of boxy look um, and sort of unarticulated, unmodulated. On the next slide, just putting it all together, this is just an example of how all of these elements work together on one kind of building mass. So you can see here the entire building frontage we've described is broken into a number of faces that are modulated and you can see that they stagger in and out with the roof line that varies. And on the sides, we've included a step back from the sides. So you can see how the top of the building is a little slimmer, a little smaller than the rest of the building. And so this is kind of the way that we've described multifamily buildings and how we can work to break them down. And we provided dimensions and kind of specific rules about how all of these things relate to each other and um, come together to kind of help make a better building design. Thanks, Kristen. So now that we uh, know our terms, we're gonna dive into some of the key standards tonight. Um, just to orient you, the document is broken up into two big sections, one uh, that dictates the design of a, of a site, and then the second one that dictates the design of a building. And the items in bold here are the ones we're gonna touch on tonight. These are the ones we heard the most community feedback on, and they're also the ones that are kind of the most prevalent if you're walking around Santa Cruz, these are the things you'll notice. So first I wanted to touch on housing typology. You heard from Sarah that there was um, a lot of community sentiment to try to increase the feasibility of rental projects and housing production. There's a big need for multifamily housing. This was really um, noticeable in our focus groups with young adults and students where a lot of them were living um, with extended family members and really voiced how much the city needs newer and more livable housing stock. So we proposed a couple of things to, to try to incentivize housing production and to also um, just see the type of eclectic styles in terms of the diversity of housing as well. So you'll see in this diagram what we're calling or what is called a stacked flat type of housing. And this is like a fourplex. It's when the circulation is within a building and you don't have individual entries of like a townhome would have. And we propose to reduce the parking requirement for this type of building by 50%. And the hope is that this will make these types of projects more palatable for developers um, and hit that missing middle of housing that's so hard to come by. We've also introduced a new housing type, um, live work units. This is a residential unit that has a commercial component um, as well. And the commercial use would be dictated by the underlying zoning. Um, a really great unit to have, we think, uh, in the midst of this pandemic. And then finally, just wanted to point out that the standards in the document really do range from these small scale um, residential projects to higher density apartments. And so we do want um, standards that speak to all these types of housing. As you heard from Sarah, we heard um, that there's a desire to make the corridors more, more active. There's a lot of people that are living a car-free lifestyle here. And we also know that greenscaping and, green and landscaping can really make the pedestrian experience more pleasant. And so we have a whole section on walkability in the standards, section 1B, and it's uh, really just about increasing connectivity. We have standards on requiring new pass passageways um, when you're on the middle of a large block or when you're adjacent to an existing public way. We want to build more um, alleyways and pedestrian paths to, to increase permeability. We also have a whole slew of standards on um, just how the foot traffic would work on a commercial corridor. So making the entries um, conveniently spaced and more attractive. We also uh, would we propose to amend the municipal code to have street tree trees placed every 30 feet. In addition to kind of the site design connectivity aspect of walkability, we also focused on the ground floor since that's such an important part of the pedestrian experience. And um, as you saw in the pie graph that Sarah showed, that there is um, a lot of support for retail and restaurant and active uses on the ground floor. And so we propose that on public frontages, so on public streets or adjacent to public parks, we would have 100% active uses. Um, and there would be some exceptions to that, but they would be to a minimum depth of 25 feet. 
We also have um, a lot of standards around the design aspects of the ground floor, such as the transparency, the height, uh, the entries, and this is all to, to make the, the retail or commercial uh, ground floors more viable and interesting, visually interesting. We have standards on sidewalks, of course, uh, proposing that corridor sidewalks would be eight, foot, eight feet wide and actually 12 feet wide for at least 80% of the building when the frontage faces a corridor. And finally, we would prohibit parking between the front lot line and the predominant building face and require parking to be screened from public view, um, regardless of whether it's in a podium, surface parking, tuck under parking, et cetera. So to touch a little bit more on the active ground floor part of the standards, uh, Sarah mentioned this, we have a little bit of a tension where survey respondents focus group participants really did want active uses, um, storefronts, especially restaurants and retail, as opposed to professional offices or building lobbies. But we also heard that um, allowing 100% residential buildings is a good trade-off to make housing more feasible and increase housing production. So where we've landed for now is that we would have 100% active uses in the commercial and tourist districts, and that on corner lots we would um, and mixed use zones, we would have it 100% non-residential uses at the corner for at least 30 feet wide on each side. And then in the zones and commercial zones where residential is allowed, we would have live work units on the ground floor. We're trying to balance the, the need for active ground floors and having some residential space as well. As Sarah mentioned, we, we know that community character and nature go hand in hand in Santa Cruz. And uh, we dug into this a little bit more in our focus groups. And uh, I think Sarah mentioned this already, but we heard that there's a lot of uh, value on private open space. You can see that corridors in, in some of these mixed use or multifamily residential buildings go unused, whereas people really sought after their own balcony or stoop where they could have a garden. And of course, uh, we also just heard throughout all of our outreach how important um, nicely designed open space is. So we have quite a few standards around this, um, proposing um, eight square feet of planted area to 40 feet of building frontage as a ratio for landscaping and commercial and mixed use zones. And we also uh, have a menu of options that open space programming would include. So there would be a requirement to choose three out of seven items in your group open space, such as shade trees or a children's playground or art components. And then finally, we to try to balance this desire for private open space, we've designed um, an incentive where private open space like a balcony or a stoop would count for double for your um, open space requirement. So if you're required to do 80 square feet of um, group open space per unit, you could actually provide 40 square feet of private open space and it would fulfill that requirement. And next, moving on to what we're calling the upper level taper. We know um, that height is a very sensitive issue. There have been concerns about shadow and privacy in this process and also in the corridors planning. Um, we asked the community what the best policy is for to be a good neighbor when you have a project come in adjacent to a single family home. And we heard that upper story side setbacks were um, the preferred method. We also know that there is support for increased building heights. You saw the amount who said no maximum height. Um, so to be sensitive to all these items, we're proposing a taper for the uppermost story of a building when it's four stories or more, and you would be required to bring in your upper story by 15%, and you couldn't just carve out notches on that upper floor. You'd have to, it would be accompanied by a, a decrease in the diagonal as well, which is what this diagram is meant to show. Um, and this is an area that we know uh, might, I'm sure will be refined as we keep moving forward in the process. Um, we have some area plans in Santa Cruz that have more specific standards than this. And Sarah will actually also talk about some mixed use districts that have additional um, setback requirements. And so this is an area that we're definitely testing out with the community and I'm sure will continue to be refined. I also wanted to note on this slide that we did look into some standards around um, shade and, and privacy, and we just found that there was not really an objective way to regulate it. 
Um, so we welcome comments and conversation about that at the end. I just wanted you to know that it is something we took seriously and we did not just ignore. And then the last group of slides here are about um, breaking up those, those blank walls and creating architectural detailing. And for all of these um, next coming standards, we provided a menu of options for architects to choose from, um, given that this was one of the preferred ways for the community um, for us to regulate these building types. So to make sure we don't have those blank walls, we have three options on, uh, these would apply when with building faces that are larger than 30 feet on public frontages. And you can break it up with um, different projections and insets, um, building materials, or these notches that could create balconies. On corners, we have um, extra, extra ways to articulate the building as well. You could have this diagonal cut to create a chamfer corner. You could have a little open space area of at least 30 square feet, or you could slightly increase the, the height on that corner roof line of at least uh, three feet above the adjacent roof line. Make, make it a little more dynamic. And then finally, um, architectural detailing, as Sarah mentioned, was um, the most important thing for the community for buildings to maintain, even if it does increase construction costs. And so we have a, a menu of options. We have four categories that have different architectural features, and your developer or architect would have to choose two out of those four categories. So those are some of the, the key standards. There are many, many more in your document if you did have a chance to look at that. Um, and we welcome comment on all of them if you do have comment or questions on them. Um, I think we actually talked about the ones that are bulleted here. Um, so I'm gonna move us on to the next slide. Great, thanks Meredith, thanks Kristen. Okay, so um, now I'm gonna talk about some mixed use zone districts. So. Part of this assignment is to reconcile the existing discrepancy between our adopted general plan and our existing zoning maps and zoning code. So um, what we know already is that, um, you know, we have high density mixed use housing that's planned along SoCal Water, Grants of 40 and Ocean. We have mid density mixed use housing planned along o Ocean and Mission Street. And we know that height has been at times controversial in Santa Cruz. So we're proposing um, some new mixed use zone districts to implement what we have in the general plan and taller heights than, in the, than we have in the current zoning would, re, would be required. So thinking about this, the setbacks and the step backs um, that would go along with those is something that we are um, really wanting to hear from the community about. So through this like final process of community engagement, um, Figuring out how those transitions work is going to be one of the most one of the key pieces of that. So just for a little bit of context, this those these are the existing standards that apply to I would say more than ninety percent of the sites that were designated for um, mixed use development in the last general plan. They're zoned in the CC zone district, our community commercial zone district, and so these are the existing standards: a height of three stories and forty feet. Um, there's no currently no additional height for mixed use. The the floor area ratio that we that applies in these sites is either 1.75 or 2.75. Currently, there's no setback that's required where a commercial um, property abuts another commercial property. The setback can be zero. Where commercial districts abut a residential zone, they have to match the setback that they come up against. Um, you can do residential only in these locations. And um, when, they're, when you're doing a residential only project, you have um, a development density of, that's equivalent to the RM zone district. So that's between 30 and it's either 30 dwelling units per acre or up to 39 if you're doing all small units. But when, there's, when you're doing mixed use in these lo locations, um, there is no density established in the zoning code. And so um, we essentially just go back to that building envelope that's established through the FAR and the general plan and then the site standards and the zoning and that, that sort of dictates how much housing can be put on one of these properties. So under the state law, we can't reduce what's here in these existing standards. So what you'll see in these proposed zone districts is that none of these numbers get smaller, um, you know, or, or if they do, so, so exa for example, the trade-off between setbacks and height, you know, we have to make sure that the full floor area ratio and the full um, development density can still be accommodated on these sites. So 
This is a map of the areas in the general plan that were redesignated for mixed use zoning. The area shown in brown is for um, mixed use high density. That's up to 55 dwelling units per acre or 2.75 floor area ratio. Um, the area shown in orange has a similar FAR and, and density, 2.75 and 55 dwelling units per acre in dark orange. And then in the light orange, that's the mixed use medium density designation. And that has a floor area ratio of 1.75 and a maximum density of 30 dwelling units per acre. So um, in creating new zone districts, we are only rezoning these sites that are redesignated in the general plan, nothing more, nothing less. Because of the way that the general plan interacts with the Ocean Street area plan, we actually need a total of six distinct zones to implement both of those plans. So um, this is where we are at this point. This is a very preliminary proposal and we are still fleshing out the details of it. Um, and these are preliminary height suggestions, recommendations, proposals that we're kind of working with and thinking through. So um, you'll see on the right side of your screen, that purple area, those are the sites that are designated for mixed use high density. Um, and right now we're proposing a five story height limit in that location. Um, you'll see on the left side of your screen along Mission, those sites are designated for mixed use medium density. We're proposing right now a four story height limit in that area. And then um, based on the heights that are already established in the Ocean Street area plan, the heights along Ocean would be um, maximum of three story or four story, um, unless we go in and do an amendment to that Ocean Street area plan, which isn't a part of this current process at this point. We can go back and go into more detail there if anyone has any questions, but that gets really technical really fast. So um, I'm just, we're gonna get into the more important issue about it, which is about, you know, how do we choose a height limit? And what are the, what are the kind of pros and cons of choosing various height limits? So um, if we think about, you know, sort of the places where there is the most intense development capacity, so places that are along ocean and along um, SoCal water brands of 40, um, where we have that 2.75 floor area ratio, we have that 55 dwelling units per acre. Um, we know we need at least four stories to facilitate that, to accommodate that. Um, with our current parking standards as they are. Um, but if we can, if we go to five, that does create this more flexible design opportunity. So we have space for additional setbacks or step backs at upper stories. We have space for more landscaping at the, at the ground level. We have space to perhaps to preserve more trees. Um, it just provides a lot more flexibility in terms of design. So there are trade-offs to be made as we, as you can recall from looking at this picture of the floor area ratio. I mean, you can keep a building low and cover more of the site at the ground level, or you can allow a building to get a little bit taller and you, you can just see how that um, creates space at the ground level for other types of things we might wanna have um, at, that, at that level. So the big question that we wanna hear from the community about, we're hearing about right now, is what's the best way to transition between existing uses and these new more intense uses as they come in, as they are, uh, you know, planned and going to be next to um, relatively lower density residential neighborhoods. So we're, I'm gonna walk you through the options that we are presenting to the public and, you know, gathering feedback about. So this is the existing case. So 2.75 FAR is allowed there. You know, if an application came in today, um, that we would, we would allow that to be, you know, three or four stories, whatever they needed to like hit, be, you know, be able to accommodate that F floor area ratio. We don't require currently any taper or anything. It's just a block. So we're looking at a cross section here. If this, if this is um, rear yard to rear yard with an R15 in our you know, current zoning, that would be a 20 foot setback um, from the property line. So first option is to go fully to four stories. We incorporate this 15% taper on the upper floor and then the architect gets to decide how that taper is designed. So it may not be centered between the front and the back. It may be, you know, the taper may be entirely at the rear, the taper may be entirely at the street side, um, or it may be on both sides and not really at the front or the rear, but, you know, it would be open for, um, for the architect to decide. Another option would be to require where that step back is so that it's always at the rear. 
So it's a, it's a similar situation to option one, but we're requiring that that reduction be taken off of the back of the property or where it abuts um, a, a neighboring lower density use. The third option is to create a wider um, landscape buffer at the back and a, and a wider setback. So going from 20 feet to 30 feet on these sites. When we do that, it pushes enough of the volume of the building toward the street that we actually, that we do need to go up to a fifth story. We need that additional height in order to accommodate that full floor area ratio. But it gives us this opportunity to have a wider, a wider um, landscape buffer at the back. And then we could still incorporate a step back at the rear or, you know, more flexibly on the building. Or the fourth option is to go with a with a model that's more of a daylight plane, where this actually then affects the, the upper two stories. So the daylight plane would start at the third story. And then um, what we're proposing is that it would be at a 45 degree angle from that corner of the third story sort of going up. And so it would push both of those stories toward away from the um, residential use, the adjacent use and toward the street. So um, that's a standard that that um, probably is going to be the more successful at affecting, you know, daylighting and shading. It, all of that really, though, depends on the orientation of the sites, you know, how they sit north, north to south relative to one another. Um, but these are the four options that we're kind of looking at and, and thinking about and trying to figure out, you know, what is the way that we want to transition between these uses? Or is it some combination of these options that you want to have? Um, you know, I, I don't know if we could do both a, a really wide 30 foot setback and the, the daylight plane, we'd have to do some analysis of that about whether that would kick us up even taller. But, um, you know, that's just how we transition between these uses is really the trade off that we're talking about. And that's what we get into when we talk about, you know, heights and setbacks. They relate to one another and, you know, we just need to figure out what's the right way to transition from one from one use to another. Okay, so that's a lot of the stuff about design that I wanted to talk to you about. There are also several things that are going to be kind of potentially coming along with this package when we bring these design standards forward. And I wanted to go through these with you as well. These are in draft form at this point, but um, so as I've mentioned, as we've been discussing, um, you know, under the state law, the city is really obligated to apply the development capacities that were in place as of January 1st, 2018. Um, when our general plan was written, it envisioned creating a whole set of zoning standards and essentially like a, um, a community benefit matrix that would allow housing to be within the range established by the general plan. It was, you know, the general plan was written under a whole different set of state re regulation than state law. That um, community benefit matrix was never successfully adopted. We don't have that right now. And so we still, what we still have lingering in our general plan is this language that talks about, um, you know, there are, there are specific criteria that you can meet that will allow you to get to this maximum. We don't, we don't have those. We have no specific criteria that will allow you to meet that maximum. And as we understand it in, in um, collaboration with the city attorney, um, we are not allowed to prevent someone from meeting the maximum that a site is planned for. So what, we, what we're proposing to do is to clean up this language in the general plan so it reflects what we're actually able to implement and enforce. So that's the intention. This is sort of draft language that we would be deleting that reference to the criteria that just simply don't exist. Um, and, you know, we're still kind of this may get refined and, and finalized before we bring it back, but we just wanted to let you know that we're, we're working on that. There are two places in the general plan where a similar change would be made. It would be in the mixed use high density land use designation and the mixed use visitor commercial land use designation. Um, another thing I wanna talk about is how we process permits for projects that meet these standards. So um, as has come up, you know, previously there is, you know, we're, we're gonna set all these objective zoning standards and then there's a, de a density bonus project could come in. And, you know, when a density bonus project comes in, when they're applying for a density bonus, they can waive standards they can't meet and they're entitled to request concessions, some limited number of concessions that are things that, um, you know, it affect the cost of constructing their project. So, um, we hear a lot of concern from your council, from our planning commission, from the community about 
density bonus projects and how we can't really predict them and we're not modeling them. Um, I understand that. It's, you know, it's a little bit, it's kind of a lot for staff to take in as well. You know, we work really hard on these standards. We think they're really great. And then to have someone just ignore them is sort of, you know, frustrating sometimes. So we're trying to think of ways that we can encourage conforming projects to that projects that really do meet all of our objective standards. And one of the tools that we have available to us is streamlining the review process and making that more predictable for developers. So um, what we're considering, and I would really like to get some feedback from your council on this today, is um, moving to an administrative review process for conforming projects. So if a project meets all of these objective standards, we would process that administratively at the staff level. And the only things then that would go to a public hearing with the planning commission or your city council would be things that we're seeking to vary in one way or another from those standards. So either they're seeking a density bonus or they're doing a planned development or they need a variance for some, for some reason. Um, the community outreach policy would stay in place um, and not be changed. So it would still provide this opportunity for the community to hear from the developer, learn about the project, provide feedback um, and response to the developer. Appeals wouldn't be changed. Um, you know, so, so projects could still be appealed out of that administrative review process. Um, but this would be one tool that we would have that could increase that certainty and sort of incentivize projects that do conform and meet all of these standards. So um, I also just want to let you know about some other things that may, uh, we're hoping to keep on track to be part of the final package when we bring this back to you for, for public hearings. Um, so, you know, in reviewing the city's first SB 35 um, development application, several departments noticed some issues in their codes where standards that they had been applying for decades were not as objective as they thought they were. So um, we are working with those departments to try and um, see if we can get these standards into a place where they are objective and they can be applied to development projects in the future. So Public Works is reviewing their standards and we are sort of, we're hoping to keep them on the same track so that we can process their, their amendments to the municipal code at the same time we bring forward this package of design um, amendments. We're also working on some standards around street trees and heritage trees to make sure that those are um, as strong as we want them to be, you know, we just adopted, the city just adopted a street tree master plan and it has a lot of great content in there that's just really close to being, turning into objective standards. So we're trying to, you know, pick that up and take those standards and make them object objective and, and make sure they have them apply in places that I think we're, where we think we're going to get the most, um, most bang for our buck. We're also taking a look at the existing heritage tree standards so that we can um, just make sure that they're working in the way that we intend them to and as effectively as possible. And our intent is to kind of, is to keep all of these components together as they as they then go to, um, when they come to council. But, you know, the reality is that they have to go to Public Works Commission and the Parks Commission, and there may be some uh, delay, uh, some offset in terms of time for some of these other pieces, but we are working on all of them and we want to bring them all back together at the same time. Oh, um, one other thing I just want to mention, and in our department, we are also doing sort of a fine grained comb through our zoning ordinance for other existing standards that we have that may be um, close to being objective, but aren't quite objective. And we're looking at ones that would, it would be easy to make objective. So um, expect to see a, a package of amendments along with these design um, standards when they come in that do a bunch of changing like should to shall, turning may to must, um, you know, things like that for the standards where it, where it makes sense to do that. So at this point in time, we are working on refining these standards, this draft that we have. We went and did a study session with our planning commission at the beginning of November um, and got a lot of really useful feedback from them. They recommended adding additional diagrams and specifically photographs to illustrate the standards. So we're um, you know, working on finding you know, photographs that we can incorporate that are gonna be really relevant to the standards as we've written them. Um, they asked about the possibility of incorporating standards relating to public safety. And I know this is something that also came up during the review of our SB 35 application. So the California Building Code um, exists to ensure that new 
buildings that are built protect residents and the public. And then the city also already has an erosion hazard, seismic hazard, and flood hazard regulation that are there to protect the public safety. And um, you know they require certain certain analysis by professionals and um, apply to every all development of more than four units. So um, those standards uh, are already in place and already you know sort of working in the public benefit within the city limits. And the, I mean the California the building standard codes work um, throughout the state. The commission also expressed interest in additional affordable housing development and asked about ways we could incentivize further affordable housing development, either through a new inclusionary requirements or other incentives. So this process is not scoped to examine our inclusionary requirement. Um, so that's not part of this process. We are trying to think about, are there other incentives that we can create that would um, you know, facilitate sort of workforce housing or um, you know, first time home buyer style housing, things that may be in the market, but at the lower end of the market, rather than explicitly those units that require subsidy. So um, so we're working on that and thinking about that and very open to any ideas um, that may come in from really anywhere, your council, the public, you know, anything, we're, we're all ears. The chair of the planning commission provided us with a list of ideas for additional standards. So we're analyzing that for potential to be incorporated. And when we bring back the final package, we'll have a full review of the standards and actually of all the standards that we've gotten from the public. We're putting them into a spreadsheet to respond specifically to each one of either about how they've been incorporated, to what extent they've been incorporated, why they weren't incorporated, why we can't do them, why they're already covered by some other existing um, local or state law. Um, the commission also discussed um, incentives for conforming projects and creating a predictability in the permit permitting process, which is, as I addressed, you know, the kind of one of the tools that we have for um, creating conforming projects is creating a predictable permit review process. Um, and then they gave it, they asked us to keep looking for ways to incorporate all of these principles. And so we're um, continuing to research and looking for ways to create certainty for all parties through this development review process. Um, we also on November 10th had a community workshop about the draft standards. It was attended by about 25 members of the community. So we introduced the draft standards um, a little bit like we did this evening with your council, um, answered questions. We heard community interest in walkability standards, in creating just an improved pedestrian experience. Um, some of the um, standards that we have about changing building materials, incorporating like living or green walls, um, people really appreciated. We, we were asked to think about incorporating 360 design. So having some of this modulation or some of the standards that we currently have only apply, they only apply to the um, frontage of the building. And there was some interest in having more of them apply, you know, on all faces of the building. So we're, we're looking into that and kind of thinking about how um, you know, to what extent we can do that. And then we heard concerns about density bonus projects. I mean, it's a big topic of concern from the community and then traffic. Um, so the traffic for all of this development that may come through creating these standards was studied when the general plan was adopted. So it was a full environmental impact report was conducted, full traffic studies, and those you know mitigations are built into the CIP that comes through. So, um, you know, we don't have a ton of influence over um, the density bonus law and we're doing what we can to you know accommodate with our through our infrastructure all the development that we're required to plan for um we also have up on our website right now um, a financial feasibility calculator so in addition to the full set of standards and then also our engagement website where people can go and you know give us sort of structured feedback and vote on various parts of the standards we also have up there um a feasibility calculator. And this is a really cool to, tool that our development, our um, consultant team came up with for us. It's an Excel worksheet that people can download. And then you can kind of adjust the development standards and see how it affects the rent that would be required for a, a building to be built. And then how those rents compare to available local rents sort of dictates how likely or unlikely it is that that project that you've identified would actually get built. Um, so our thinking is that this can be integrated into future planning efforts. I think this might be a useful tool to have as we move into the housing element as well. Um, and it's available on our website and you can kind of just see how, you know, how much a parking space costs, honestly. I mean, I was, I was shocked at how, at that and how sort of adjusting that parking ratio can really influence how feasible it is to actually get a project developed or what type of, um, 
you know, what, what type of density, what type of floor area ratio is really going to um, support development at this point in our market. So this is based on market conditions as of 2019. So it's like pretty recent data. Um, and it's just, it's a really interesting tool. I encourage you to check it out. Um, also, just about a week and a half ago, we had a developer focus group. So to hear from the people who would actually be like working with these standards, how um, you know, kind of get their reactions at first. And we had we had ten participants. We had both for-profit developers, nonprofit developers, and architects as part of that group. And um, they responded positively to the idea, this, the flexibility that's built into these standards. They did have concern about um, requiring active uses. They're really concerned about programming re retail spaces in the current market. Um, and then they ha also had concerns about, you know, regulating architectural style and essentially, you know, the way the standards are written now, we're, we're kind of discouraging that really boxy contemporary design. Um, and that's because that's what we heard from the community that they really they had very strong reactions to that. So, um, you know, we're we're taking that feedback and we're going to you know take that with whatever feedback we hear from from your council as well as what we hear from the public, and um, that will go into refining these standards um, before we bring them back. So, we can bring them back. Our next steps are that um, you know our website engagement is open until next Monday, the sixth of December, and um, I'm actually hosting a set of office hours on Saturday. So if anyone is reading through the standards and they don't understand something or they have a question, um, I'm going to be. We have a Zoom link on our website, and I'm going to be available on Saturday at 10 a.m. for an hour with one of our consultant team um, to answer any questions. Make sure they can you know access the all the various tools and they understand um, the feedback that they're giving us. So the financial calculator is going to stay on our website and that's going to be available, you know, sort of indefinitely. And I, you know, encourage people to download that and check it out. And then um, public hearings on the standards, the general plan text amendment, any other code amendments that we can keep on the same schedule will be sometime um, in the, you know, Q1 of 2022. And um, we're really looking forward to getting these in place and getting them um, applying to development. So with that, uh, that is our presentation and we're available for any questions and welcome your comments on all of it. Sarah, I think um, if you wouldn't mind, I think we probably all could take a five minute break just to um, do a little bio break here. Um, <clears throat> and so just, and also Sarah, I'm just curious, I just wanna make sure um, it's about 8.45 right now and um, so we're, um, going into the evening, which is fine. Um, questions tonight, is that the most productive thing or are you available if council members have some specifics about you know, how something may look or whatever? I'm just curious about how I maybe manage some of the questions versus some of those big top, kind of bigger topics that you had mentioned. Because I think we could spend a lot of time on looking at roof designs and I'm thinking it's probably better for council members to maybe stop by and really kind of dig into those details. But I just want to make sure I, I we get done what you need, get done you, what we get done what you need to tonight. What what would be your kind of direction on that? Sure. I um obviously up to you, you as the mayor and the, and the council. Um, we are available if if council members want to send email or have a phone call or set up a meeting. Um, you know, we're available to talk through any of the any of the smaller details. <clears throat> okay. Okay. Great. Rosemary, yeah. Did you? Yeah. Yeah. Thanks. Um, I just wanted to uh, say that this is obviously really really an important piece of work, right? And I know that was a really dense conversation with a lot of content in it. And I think these guys have done a great job from my perspective of engaging the community, and they have a lot of really fabulous work to. Show off. I think it's really important that um, because it's such important work for the for our future as a community that there be uh, that you didn't get it all the way baked at the end. So I think right. the big goal here tonight is not so much a big discussion about it, but if there's something about what you just saw or heard that gives you a lot of heartburn or that you love and you want to, you know, it's kind of almost like a give us the top of mind uh, feedback so that, and, and then follow up if you want uh, to make sure that uh, if there's something in here that you want to see more of or less of, or you have huge questions about, that's the takeaway. So that when it comes back to you after the planning commission, 
it has your fingerprints on it to some degree and that it's not going to be a complete surprise and then we have to decide what to do about it. That's my goal. Yeah, thank you, Rosemary, for, for clarifying that. And I think that's a really good strategy. Um, and so, yeah, to the extent that we have questions, you know, let's kind of meter a little bit of a little bit higher level maybe right now, knowing that, you know, we'll have a few more bites at this apple. And, um, um, but I just also, so we'll take a, a minute, a few minute breaks here, but I also just want to recognize Sarah and our consultants. Um, really great presentation. You guys have done an amazing job on the outreach and, um, yeah, you've just explored a lot of nooks and crannies that really make people uncomfortable with, about development. And so those are the things sometimes that really can kill a project just because people just weren't asked about some of those details or some of those um, decision points, or they felt like, you know, they just were not, they don't understand why things look like they look. So I, I think um, you're, you're, you've been so thorough, so thank you. Let's just take a five minute break and then we'll come back and we'll try to keep things at a pretty high level and get you what you need tonight. Thank you.
we'll go ahead and start back up. Um, so we'll go ahead and take this out for um, questions from council initially. Any questions from council on all these items, all, all the information presented? Councilmember Cummings. Thank you, Mayor, and thank you, staff, for that presentation. Um, I'm going to keep it brief in the interest of time. Um, I did have, so I'm just going to. Um, I have three questions, and then after it comes up, goes up to public comment, I'll have some comments to make, um, just to provide some context. But the beginning of this presentation really kind of focused on um, the previous zoning and land use and how a lot of the policies were um, inherently racist. And I'm just kind of curious, uh, because a lot of the discussion was around building design standards and really didn't kind of tackle that topic, and so I'm just kind of wondering... Mm -hmm like what is being built into these design standards to actually address some of what was brought up within that context? Sure, yeah, no, that's a really good question. Thanks for um, thanks for bringing that up. So um, I think primarily the goal is that we're writing standards that can facilitate the creation of multifamily housing. And so by creating standards that are objective, that we can, that can be impl implemented and that create um, development that's really feasible to construct, that we are allowing that multifamily housing that's been missing um, through zoning and then through just, you know, pushback um, to actually be created. And I really do believe that allowing this multifamily housing to be created in the census tract where it's currently planned to be created is a step towards rectifying some of that racial segregation that we see on that map that we have. Because the places that are you know, designated and zoned and built with multifamily housing are highly concentrated with our minority populations. So that's, I mean, that's, for me, that's really where it comes in, is just facilitating the construction of housing that's already planned. That's like it. But, sorry. Sorry, I was just going to add to that. We did, um, we did a number of test fits, and our economist ran feasibility studies on those test fits, and they found that it was... Um, almost infeasible to develop most projects within the existing zoning constraints. So just to that point, we were looking at ways that we could help um, make it more feasible to actually build that housing. Okay. Um, the next question, um, you know, one of the biggest concerns that led to the rejection of the corridors plan was the kind of disproportionate density on the east side versus the west side. And it, and it seems like that map is pretty much the same. Yeah. And so I'm wondering, and I've spoke with some community members about this, and they were even saying, people who are supportive of the corridors plan were even saying, you know, it'd be, if we really want to, you know, I'll take a step back. What some of the folks were saying was that, you know, it would have been good if we could have just continued working on that and dealt with those density issues rather than rejecting the plan. But it seemed like there's a lot of pushback in terms of how we could actually balance that density. And so I guess the question is, you know, given that we're going to continue to get a lot of community pushback with the current density proportions of having higher on the east side versus the west side, you know, what can we do to start balancing that out? Because that, I think, overwhelmingly, that is one of the biggest reasons why there's so much pushback on the quarters plan to begin with, and we probably would be further along had we addressed that. And it's going to continue to be an issue and a political issue if we don't do something about it. Yeah, no, absolutely. Um, well, so so a couple of things. So first of all, um, you know, we we did get direction from your council to um, hold off on doing any amendments to the land use pattern of the general plan until this process was complete. So at this point, we're working on completing this process under the existing general plan. And then if at some point in the future, your council wants to direct that we engage in this, like, big, gnarly um general plan amendment process to really start shifting density around, um, you know, that's something that we can get into and talk about, right? Because that's, you know, that's not a small project. That's a community-wide project that's, you know, we're talking, the state law requires that we can't um, reduce capacity anywhere without increasing it somewhere else. And then I would just also like to mention that, um, you know, not all housing density is equal in terms of who those units can serve. So one of the things that we also found from our test fits, so we did test fits, um, the eco our economist looked at 
um, two sites that were um, identified for the mixed use high density, a large site and a small site. And then she also looked at um, a site that was designated for the um, RL zone, which is our low density um, multifamily <coughs> zone. Her analysis was that those RL sites are not gonna get developed with multifamily housing. We're not gonna see that happen. It doesn't pencil out right now at today's land prices. So I, you know, we are, we will see some projects come in if people have owned the property for a long time, they get a great deal on the land, you know, things like that. But those properties are worth so much as single family home properties that to redevelop them when, you, when you're only allowed to build three units, I mean, you might as well just keep the house and add one ADU and you're gonna get, you know, the, a better return on your investment. So, um, and, and, then it, and then let's pretend you're in a situation where you can build um, three housing units on an RL site. You're gonna build three townhomes and you're gonna sell them. They're not gonna be rental housing because no one wants to manage a project that that's, that's that small. And so you're not gonna be creating rental housing and you know a 12 to 1400 square foot townhome is gonna serve a different population than you know, a smaller apartment, it's part of a mixed use project on a transit corridor. So that's something that, you know, if we do start to rebalance that density and think about relocating some of it elsewhere, which I think is a fair conversation to have in the context of amending the general plan land use pattern, um, that has to be part of the consideration is that, you know, what type of housing are we gonna be creating and how, are, how is our zoning gonna facilitate the type of housing that we need for the demographics that we have? And then the last, thank you for that. And then the last um, question I had was around the intensity of land use and also as that relates to kind of the map that was drawn with the uh, increased density along some of the corridors, because it's uh, the, de the, the diagrams that were shown were really showing like, you know, you have a variety of different types of housing. You can have, you know, one story that's gonna cover more like surface area versus you know, more stories that cover less service here and, and open up more open space. But, but the, I guess the question I have is that, you know, with the areas that were kind of demonstrated in those maps, most of there, there's really no open space in those areas. And if we can't reduce the intensity of land use, how is it that we would end up getting any additional open space when much of those, the land that uh, is currently along those corridors, there's either commercial space or residential or mixed, mm -hmm. right? So I guess the way that I was understanding it is that since the intensity of those spaces is already either commercial or residential, what you would likely get on top of those spaces is more commercial or residential, right? Okay. You need the reduction. I so, see, I understand your, I understand your question. Um, so I think this comes down to um, what do we mean when we say open space? So in the context of these standards and in the context of our zoning code, talking about multifamily housing, every multifamily housing development has a requirement for a minimum amount of open space to be built into the project, either through private patios, through common courtyards, through you know play areas for children. So that's what we're talking about when in the context in this context, we're talking about you know open space that's provided on the property. We're not talking about you know wild spaces yeah. so um yeah so so that's going to be built into the project so as a site redevelops even if it's all paved today right if it gets redeveloped we're creating space for landscaping we're creating space to in put trees in if there are none on the property you know at least street trees if nothing else within the property and there are incentives in the standards that actually encourage planting you know shade trees or and and even bigger incentives if you can maintain an existing tree on the site so, so that's what we mean when we're talking about, you know, creating open space. It's within that development. Okay. Yeah, that was helpful for clarification because when I thought about intensity of land use, and if we can't change the intensity of that land use, then that means then my understanding is that if an area is paved, it's going to be paved moving forward, and there's no opportunity to creating any kind of community space that's open space since it's already been paved over. So. Right. Yeah. No, that's not, I mean, you can, they, that site could redevelop in a whole bunch of different ways, right? Like they could, you know, consolidate all the open space requirement and put it towards the front of the property and, you know, carve out like a community space or connect it to a commercial use. So it's kind of this like commercial courtyard that like counts partially towards their obligation for the rest of the project. And then, you know, the upper story units maybe have 
balconies and the lower story units have better access to this courtyard. And, it, you know, there are lots of different ways that that, that stuff can be put together. I'll stop my questions there. Um, I do have some comments before we kind of close out, but in the interest of time, um, if I have any other questions, I'll send them along. Okay. Member Brown. <laughs> thank you, Mayor. Uh, thank you, <laughs> Sarah, and our consultant team for um, what's obviously been, uh, you know, uh, in-depth and in engaging community process. And thank you for bringing all of your expertise to the table. Um, also to all of the staff out there who have been combing through our code and all of that. I know this is, uh, it's very complicated and, um, and I appreciate all you're doing. I have a ton of questions and I'm not gonna ask them here um, in the interest of time, but I would love to take you up on the offer and maybe schedule a time to mm -hmm. Uh, dive in a little deeper, um, and I didn't get a chance to ask for that before this meeting, but I I definitely will reach out. <laughs> um, one question that I wanted to ask, and it's it kind of relates back to Councilmember Cummings' questions about um, you know the density and proposed potential zoning changes in the various corridors, and in particular the. Um, you know, higher density proposed for, for the east side corridors. I totally agree with all of the comments that you made about, you know, controversy and, you know, the challenges um, associated with um, the uh, concentration of new units and new production happening in a, in a very small area that's already got higher density than um, a lot of the rest of the town, in particular the west side. And so I have some specific questions about that. Like, really, we can't get five stories on the Mission Street. <laughs> it's just hard for me to understand. So I'll, um, I'll, I'll talk with you about that offline. But um, just while we're here, since there are members of the public presumably watching, I just um, wanted to ask if you could share, um, with respect to the question of height, um, what actual height would be allowed with those new zoning, those new height, um, uh, possibilities, right? So five stories doesn't mean necessarily five stories, um, given the potential density bonus. So can you just share what, what that, and I know there's all kinds of variables and mm -hmm. would a developer even ask for, would they ask for 30% or 50% and all of those variables so you can't really give a definitive answer. But I would just like to know kind of outside um, if projects did go for that maximum density increase for these larger projects, what the actual number of stories allowed would be, could could potentially be. Sure. So, um, so there there are a couple pieces to this answer. So the first piece, um, you know, you've correctly identified is that um, there are lots of different ways a density bonus can be applied, and um, height is often you know one of the waivers that's requested, but not always. Um, also, you know, a thirty five percent debt bonus of density on a two-story building yields, you know, typically would be one additional story, but depending on the configuration of the parcel and the design of the building and, you know, the type of units, it could be two stories. So um, it's not always just a straight line between the percentage of the bonus and then the amount of height increase. It's actually like really difficult to, pre to predict because it, there are so many factors that go into it. Um, The other thing I was going to mention too is that so the, the bonus is um, a bonus based on the number of units and the number of units is related to the floor area ratio. So the number of units that you could get as a bonus is going to be a larger number of units in those places that are already zoned for more units than it is going to be in places that are already zoned and designated in the general plan for fewer units. So that that's also a key piece. So, um, you know, a 35% bonus is not going to be um, what am I trying to say here? A 35% bonus is going to be more units on a site that has more density already than it is going to be on a smaller site. So that's another component of it. So then, so having said all of that, um, you know, the 100% affordable project at this moment in time is um, entitled to three additional stories above the zoning and an unlimited amount of density that they can fit within that envelope. So, you know, I mean, I think that's probably a reasonable place to start. I mean, how many 100% affordable projects do we have? 
currently in, you know, like going on in the city. I think we have like two or three in the pipeline, but you know, not 20 in the pipeline. Um, uh, you know, in general, a developer isn't going to make a building taller than they have to, right? So if they can get that number of units with one less story, they're going to try and do that because that's going to be a cheaper building to build. Um, and you're absolutely right that the density bonus, you know, can shift how these how these standards hit the ground, you know? Um, so I, I don't know, you know, like, so five stories, could it be eight? I don't know if it actually could because... The 2.75 FAR wouldn't fully fill, it wouldn't be five full stories. Do you know what I mean? Like it would be three full stories and two partial stories. So if they get the density bonus, first they're gonna fill out those stories and then they'll go up. So the math on that is gonna look different on every piece of property, right? So maybe it's six stories is all they would need to hit that 35 or 50% bonus. Um, you know, I, it, it's very, very site specific and project specific. Gotcha. Yes, absolutely. I, I that I do know. Um, but I just wanted to be clear, just for the yeah. public, and this is not to scare people or anything like that, but just to be aware of the realities of, of this, right? Mm -hmm. That we're talking about. Um, we could be talking about. Well, and so the, the, the last piece that I'll just say is that that's the truth yeah. today, right? Like we, they are entitled to this two point seven five floor area ratio. They can get a density bonus on top of that. We don't have a height limit, so it's the building will be as tall as it needs to be. That's true now under the law, so, yeah. Okay, thank you. I'll leave it there for now. Council Member Watkins. Uh, thank you, and yeah, thank you, Sarah, and thank you, team, for being here this, this evening, but for all your work, obviously, you've done a lot within a short period of time, and I know that you've really reached out and made an intentional um, effort to really touch on all the different community groups that want to weigh in or hadn't maybe wanted to weigh in, but definitely had a voice in this process, so I appreciate all the due diligence that you have done. I think I, I, I think I can kind of just sort of, I think I have two questions and maybe a couple of comments. So one, I think for the next general plan process, part of that informed why we wouldn't want to reopen, um, you know, our existing general plan. When, when do you anticipate like that planning process to start? Um, so, you know, the last, um, the last general plan process took about seven years. Um, that seems, it's a little long because we hit that, you know, um, economic downturn. Typically, I would expect it to take more like, you know, four to five years and, you know, it has a 2030 time horizon. So, mm -hmm. um, you know, do the math on that, 25, 2025, 2026. Okay. Like okay. So you anticipate that. Okay. And then in terms of the, I think it was the setback or the setback options, could you do a variety within the objective standards, like based on the community input and the developer, could you do kind of the more um, stark difference or the two and then the, and then the, I, I don't remember the slide and how it was actually scaling, but like, could that be a menu of options for that specific standard? Um, it could, I don't see why not. Okay, I mean, because you think that would allow for community input into what they think would work, you know, in terms of those transitions that feel, and developer, I mean, not yeah. sure, but. Right, I mean, I guess, the so yeah, the one caution we'd want to have is that, like, the developer chooses it. You know, the community doesn't get to choose it on a project. They can provide feedback, right? We do have a community outreach policy, um, but if it's one of the options, it's one of the options, you know? Um, so... <coughs> I mean, but if if it, it, I can also see an, a a situation where we come where we have different transitions for different intensities of uses, right? So you know, on this on these highest intensity sites, we have one way that we do the transition, and on these lower and on lower intensity sites, maybe we have a different way that we do transition. You know? Okay, so you can. Have we like also we also had a focus group with developers where we got their feedback on these standards and what they thought would be feasible or infeasible. And they actually also thought a menu of options would be a good choice. And, you know, they were quite sensitive to the fact that they want to be good neighbors and they want to kind of pick, be allowed to pick things that would be more, um, would make for better neighbors. <laughs> oh, that's great. That's, I mean, that's encouraging to hear it because you want to, I mean, you want to have, I would want to have that kind of dialogue. 
happen with our you know bigger developments and it seems like if there's an option that would work in one community that doesn't you know one neighborhood that doesn't work in a different one it'd be nice to be able to have it you know available potentially um i guess so my other question there or maybe comment is in terms of the previous work with the housing blueprint subcommittee have any of those recommendations been incorporated into kind of informing this um kind of this work that you've embarked on at this point that's a great question. So I know that we have been chipping away at that work in the housing blueprint subcommittee, and I am going to ask Lee or Matt or Eric to jump in here and help me with that. So um, uh, in general, the what we got out of that housing blueprint was like looking for ways to make our land use efficient and to make housing more feasible to construct. So in terms of those like overall values, I do think they like sort of are infused into this whole process. In terms of like specific recommendations, I am not deliberately incorporating any of those at this point because I believe we're largely through those um, 99 recommendations. Is that, Lee, do you have a thought? And, and you, don't, you don't have to answer right now. I guess I just would, my only thought around that is essentially saying like, we did this really robust community yeah. outreach process that I think could really inform a lot of the community sentiment around priorities for housing development in our community that could help maybe inform some of these standards. Um, you know, so I, I don't know where we are, but I do know that there's a lot of community voice in that, in that, right. that re those recommendations that I think could be incorporated. Yeah. Okay. We'll, we'll take another look at those. I mean, I think my, my recollection of that, you know, sort of, it's been a while since I read the subcommittee report. Um, but a lot of it was around like actually getting the housing built. Yeah. Right, like actually making it feasible, making the process work, um, making it predictable for all parties, community developers, decision makers, and um, you know that's inherently what this project is about. Yeah, yeah I I would just add I, I would agree with Sarah. One of the um, key legs of the housing voices uh, report in the housing blueprint subcommittee was housing production, and. As you heard from both Sarah and our consultants, you know a, a key um, component of this is um, recognizing how projects, multifamily projects in particular, can actually be feasible, and that's where we'll have an opportunity to get a, a larger number of houses produced is through those multifamily projects. Um, I, I do think it's worth um, revisiting and seeing because there were a wide array of comments, and not all of them. Um, made it as um, specific recommendations, but certainly the, some of those themes um, would carry over into this uh, project as well. And um, I would note that um, that work is still guiding some of the um, city's um, uh, policies that we're aiming to move forward. Um, so for example, um, uh, Sarah and um, an intern that we have right now are working on um, some of the recommendations with a planning commission subcommittee related to um, small ownership units and um, single room occupancy and, and moving to a new flexible development unit standard. So um, that work is still um, in progress. We've, we have made a lot of, prog of progress, but um, we are still in process on some of those uh, recommendations as well. Thank you for that. And then I, I guess my last sort of comment or question, um, you know, if you have a response to it is, is there, you know, as Councilmember Cummings brought up, like really this was really preferenced around really trying to change some of the past um, really structural policies that led to segregated housing that we now currently are kind of still experiencing. And, and part of, I think what, um, accompanies that is other policy solutions around how we're incentivizing either like home ownership for minority populations or other barriers to being able to have integrated communities. And I'm just wondering how, you know, what could look good in terms of housing kind of land use policy, how does it actually translate or accompany other initiatives that are gonna really be able to move the needle around um, some of these kind of past, more pronounced areas of um, segregated housing. And I, and I will say, you know, in, in our community, it's obviously not as pronounced as a lot of some of the bigger urban communities. I mean, coming going up to the Bay Area, I have a lot of family up in the Bay Area. Oakland is very different than Santa Cruz. And, 
you know, so we don't necessarily have it, I think, as pronounced as other jurisdictions might. But um, nonetheless, I think that, you know, as a community, we can really undo some of past, you know, wrongs with some of how our housing policies have led to, um, you know, racism and segregated housing. But that also kind of means not only just sort of creating standards, but really accompanying other efforts to support, you know, more integration in other ways. So you don't have to have a response to that, but just sort of thinking about that as we move forward with how we want to kind of address these past problems. Yeah. No, I just, I'll have, I have a, my, a brief, I have two brief comments in response to that. So um, first of all, I, I just think, I think that um, one of the, one of the biggest things we can do is allow multifamily housing in more places and really find that right level of density that can provide home ownership opportunities for people who cannot afford single family homes in our community. Um, and I don't, you know, we're not doing that super well right now. We're not creating townhomes or condos um, at any kind of rate, like the rate that we need them at. So I, I think that's a key piece. And then the other piece I'll say is that, um, you know, I think there's a lot of financial policy that goes into creating those opportunities. And I do think there are places where the city um, has some opportunities to pursue. And I know that economic development is like pursuing every opportunity that they have to um, find funding sources and pursue projects that they think are gonna um, address a lot of these needs that we have in our community. And hopefully the state is gonna be stepping in and the federal government even with this infrastructure package with different kinds of funding for housing. And that I think that can really make a difference because the way that the, you know federal and state funding for affordable housing has just tanked in the last 20 years is just really remarkable. And we are seeing it nationwide in terms of the housing affordability crisis that we're facing that is affecting um, black and brown populations in a different way than white populations. So um, that financial, those financial tools coming in, I think are gonna give us a lot more options and um, one piece that I am sort of like creating on the side as we go through this process is a lot of great ideas have come up through this process that we can't do right now that aren't really scoped for this project. So I have like a running tab um, in my file. I have my little Excel sheet where I'm like keeping track. And when we come back with like the final package, that's gonna be one of the things I, I bring of like, here's our, here are ideas for future work that could also kind of move the needle on housing on like one or the other aspect around housing. Um, but we couldn't do them right now. And like, are you even interested in some of these? Cause they're like really creative <laughs> ideas. So, um, but yeah, so that's, that's something that I'm kind of keeping track of as well. One thing also that we did, I'm sorry, go ahead. <laughs> I was just gonna add one other thing that we did do in this piece of work um, related to kind of design standards and trying to incentivize different types of housing is, um, uh, Meredith mentioned when when you can do stacked flats instead of townhomes, we've actually in included a parking reduction, which is from all of our work on feasibility studies and through developer focus groups. That seems to be one of the best incentives is reducing the amount of parking that has to be built. Um, and so we do hope that by including this incentive, we'll be able to have kind of a little bit more push towards this, what's called a missing middle type of housing which is a little bit, tends to be more affordable than something like a townhome um, and tends to be more rental unit than condo. So it's a small thing, but we think it might actually, hopefully will have a big impact. That's great. Well, thank you. I appreciate the response. I look forward to seeing the creative um, list that you have, you know, compiled, Sarah, that sounds great. I mean, I guess the last comment I were, you know, I would, I, I don't know, you know, I guess the one thing I, I'm kind of wondering about is, is like a post-pandemic world look different in terms of changing our expectations of the types of housing people want to live in, right? And you saw the supply demand of New York City, for example, go down, right? Because people wanted more space and not to live in more dense housing. And, you know, we've operated under this assumption that that's sort of the best way to go. And I just sort of wonder, you know, I mean, maybe this is sort of a meta concept, but what does a post-pandemic housing structure look like? now that we're now factoring in public health issues. So obviously you don't need a response to that, but definitely something to think about or something I'm thinking about. Anyways, thank you. Go ahead. Um, council member, uh, sorry, Vice Mayor Bruner and then I'll take council member Contrary Johnson and then I'll cue myself in a two quick, two quick questions and then I think we'll go to public comment. Thank you. Um, what 
what is your next step after December 6th when this um, ends, this part of that process? Um, so then we start work on refining and getting to a final draft of these standards. So, you know, what we have right now is a public review draft and we are accepting comments and we are getting comments. And um, so we're we're gonna need to go through and, and refine them. I mean, there are, there are a couple of standards in there that we already know, like, oh, we need to define this term. You know, we're talking with our um, current planners as well that are gonna be, you know, the staff on the city side that's gonna be implementing them. And they're like, define this word for us clean up this diagram. So um, that that's sort of the next phase of work. And then putting it all, taking the document, this nice, this beautiful document that you have in front of you and <laughs> turning it into um, code amendments because it's going to be integrated into our municipal code. Um, and it's not going to be this beautiful standalone document anymore. So, um, you know, that that's a, a piece of work to just make sure that it fits into our chapter and integrates with the other existing standards. Um, you know, I mentioned we're working with some other departments getting their standards into shape to be more objective. And we're doing like a full sweep of our existing standards to make those um, existing standards that are not fully objective, but can be and should be made fully objective, fully objective. So um, that's the next, that's the next piece of work that we're digging into. Uh, okay, thank you. And then um, I'm curious what so in one of the slides you showed um, responses uh, to ground floor uh, uses mm -hmm. and um, commercial space um, versus full uh, residential. And um, in this context, the commercial space, um, how... How constrained is that? Are there options to keep a more open definition of what that looks like? And 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 I just say that in in the content context of how things have changed over the past ten years. For example, with retail, we're not looking at huge uh, square footage spaces so much anymore, but things have shifted to more smaller spaces, incubator spaces, um, live work spaces. And I think you mentioned that um, having experiential spaces, um, you know, where the, the front is not a shop necessarily, but maybe a recording studio or a dance class or, um, you know, smaller, like the kiosks downtown, having those little smaller food places, um, I'm just wondering how how that fits in in this context, de defining what that is in terms of objective standards. Is it an open interpretation? Um, so I wouldn't say it's an open interpretation. We do have um, a list of uses that's already in our code for the CC zone district, and that's kind of what we based our um, active uses standard around um but we did talk about like also allowing other kind of non-residential uses like sh you know in some places would it be okay to allow you know like government agencies would it be okay to allow you know um blanking like medical offices for example so things that can services that serve the neighborhood maybe they're not quite as active but you know it kind of makes sense for them to be on that ground floor we did do a lot of thinking and back and forth about like what are those right the minimum dimensions of a commercial space to make sure that it like can actually support like a legit commercial use um, versus, you know, not being so prescriptive that we like create a bigger space than like the trend in, in retail. Um, and, and, you know, and that's definitely a place where, um, you know, we went back back and forth a lot internally about like, what are those right dimensions? And, um, you know, is micro retail, like there is some, a market for that, but if we let that, if, that, if the, the whole corner is micro retail, like right. that's probably that's gonna be too much, right? So we're trying to like figure out how to strike that balance. Um, and we I, we are absolutely open to comments and suggestions and, and insight. Yeah, it seems like having, having those options or having, I'd, I'd love to talk more about, yeah, how that fits in. Yeah, okay, great. I'd like that too. 
I'll, I'll send you an email. Okay, thank you. Uh, thank you, Vice Mayor, Council Member Contari Johnson. Thank you, and thanks so much, Sarah and the team, Kristen Meredith, for all the work that you've done. This is um, incredible document that you've brought before us and a lot of work, so I appreciate that. I have a lot of specific questions that I'll hold off and send an email, but wanted to ask two questions here. Um, the agenda report mentions the um, potential for additional impact and permit fees collected, um, anticipating more housing development. Are those fees, do those fees go strictly to cover um, the cost to make the, make the projects happen, or is there opportunity to use some of those towards our affordable housing, housing trust fund to build more affordable housing? So that's one question. And then you really piqued my interest when you talked about um, financial opportunities from federal and state. Um, so what are the things that we need to think about to be ready and competitive so that we, we can jump on those opportunities as they come? Um, so I'm gonna ask Lee to jump in on that fee question. I don't actually know the answer to that, but I'll take a stab at your second question. So um, I think, you know, the, the first thing we need to do is to get our, um, get our zoning and general plan aligned, how, whatever that looks like, um, get our housing element approved, adopted and approved. And then um, I, I do think that this um, new designation of being a, a pro housing jurisdiction could be really beneficial. Um, you know, I haven't seen anything yet. I haven't read anything yet about how that federal sort of HUD money is going to be distributed, whether that's going to just essentially go to housing authorities and give them, you know, just a bigger pool to work with, or um, whether there are going to be new sort of grant or um, ongoing funding programs that come out of that. Um, but in terms of the state money, um, they are doing more and more to, to tie all of your grant funding to like, are you meeting your arena? Are you making adequate progress on your arena? Have you adopted these pro housing policies? Is your ADU ordinance up to date? So um, I think all, all of those are gonna be beneficial. Thank you. And with respect to the fees, they cover staff time and costs. We cannot charge extra for um, the permit fees. Um, you know, the, the way that we're typically getting affordable housing uh, production through residential development is through our inclusionary ordinance. And so um, that or in lieu fees associated with that or land dedication associated with the inclusionary ordinance or so, and so forth. So there are options associated with the um, inclusionary ordinance that are, are the, the typical way in which the residential um, produces affordable housing. Thank you for clarifying. Um, I just have a couple quick questions and then we'll definitely go out to um, to the public. Um, I was interested in the usable open space concept and um, uh, just curious about kind of the scenario of, you know, when I think about mixed use and I think about sort of more dense neighborhoods, it's really nice to have some you know, really amenity-based commercial rather than just retail or, you know, and so I, I mean, I think about all the little tiny grocery stores that exist in some towns, you know, and the, or, or specialty grocery, things like that, where, you know, we just don't have those here. So, you know, you end up having to drive over to shoppers, you have to drive over to Whole Foods, even though, you know, you may, if you were living in that corridor, um, you know, there may be opportunity for those kinds of uses. And so I, my question on the usable open, or, you know, kind of usable open space concept is, are we, would we be missing an opportunity if we didn't include kind of that classic small grocer where part of the produce and things are out on the sidewalk where you're coming in and you're looking, you know, it becomes an experience because you're sort of you're experiencing that in a public space, but then it draws you basically into the grocery store. So, you know, I think about places you see and, you know, a lot, usually it's other countries because they, they live just, they just live more densely than we do, right? So you've got your living area, but most, you know, people have their, their businesses underneath their homes. So you've got kind of these vibrant, you know, small spaces, but they're actually an amenity that it's a pharmacy, it's, you know, whatever, a butcher, it's a small grocery store. Do you see the, cause those I feel like are places that really make 
place is vibrant, right? I mean, those are places that people use, they're going through there several times a day because they have these amenities that they need to get to. Do you feel like this plan would support that kind of experience along these places or not? As you've thought, as you've kind of looked at them right now, and is there any, you know, any fixing we need to do if if we would lose that kind of experience? Um, yeah. So I think so. Support and allow might be two different things, um, but we definitely when we were writing these standards about the commercial uses, we wanted to make sure that they could still allow a larger commercial use, like a grocery store. Um, and at the same time, we did, we got, we, we had a meeting, um, I had a meeting with the Midtown Business Association, M MBA, yeah, Midtown Business Association. Um, and they were, they were actually pretty concerned that, that, um, we would be facilitating spaces that could be really big and be like Target. Um, and so we were trying to kind of like not a, not exclude a grocery store, but also maybe exclude Target. And um, that is like pretty difficult um, path right. to weave. Um, and I think this was an interesting comment you had about display on the sidewalk, because I think typically um, we don't allow people to encroach that way, but maybe that's something we should think about, especially since we're talking about making wider sidewalks, you know, 12 feet wide on these corridors, um, that we should allow some, you know, part of that frontage to be used for display of merchandise. Yeah, I mean, yeah. and especially if it's a food establishment, you know, I mean, and maybe there's rules in California that don't allow this, but I mean, I think, Anybody who's stumbled upon a small grocery store where they have their best looking fruit out there and a couple, you know, it's just, it, it makes you want to go inside the door, you know, plus for vehicle miles traveled and climate change, it's like, I think we should try to be incorporating what used to be those kind of old time uses back into these kinds of neighborhoods, you know, and so, I mean, you know, 7-Eleven's great, but it's not really giving healthy food into the communities that really need to have diff a different. So I think about the little market down on Lower Ocean, you know, they have their little farmer's market every year, every Wednesday. So, you know, that's the kind of thing I think these kinds of spaces could really benefit from. And I just want to make sure we don't lose the opportunity, you know, and maybe think through a little bit of that. Um, the only other thing I was just curious about is, you know, this, you know, when we think about these open spaces too, you know, I think the other thing I just want to make sure we don't lose the opportunity is would be if there is a, you know, sort of a possible, you know, uh, garden garden box concept, you know, where maybe people could be growing some things in these common spaces or even more importantly, pollinator gardens and other things, you know, so it's it's, you know, we, we don't slip into kind of just street trees, but we're thinking a little bit outside that box of, you know, because these places are gonna be next to busy roads. So I realize there's a safety factor, but sometimes those those amenities sort of help you ignore that, that reality of a bunch of cars moving around. So I just wanna make sure that we're not, you know, we're not just, we're not strictly, we're, we're not making our sidewalk spaces so strict that, you know, we don't, we're not able to make that more intimate feel. That's, I guess, what I'm trying to say. So. One, one other thing um, for the for the open space idea, um, we talked about the common open space requirement and how we're, you know, wanting to allow for more balconies and things like that. We also allowed for uh, 30, up to 30% of your common open space that is used for retail to be counted towards your common open space. So if you wanted to have something like the buttery, where you have a little kind of outdoor dining area, mini plaza, you can count that towards your common open space up to a certain amount. Okay, okay, that's helpful too, yeah, great. And then the other thing that I think on retail that would really support and enable retail more than anything else um, would be parking reduction, because again, the minimum parking ratios for retail are, are, especially for restaurants, are quite high. Mm -hmm. And so to the extent that parking is land intensive, you're using a lot of your land to build, um, you know, places to park cars instead of housing for people and, and other businesses. So um, to the extent that you really wanted to support those types of uses, 
the most impactful thing you could do would be to reduce the parking ratio for retail. Okay, great, great. Well, those are um, my thoughts as I was watching, kind of seeing the spaces, which, you know, are, are really, you know, they're, they're going to be pretty cool if we can get that diversity. Yeah, yeah. go ahead. Yeah. One other thing to add, um, back in around 2015, 2016, um, we did amend our uh, zoning ordinance to allow for outdoor extension areas citywide, mm -hmm. like we see uh, downtown. Um, we haven't had a lot of takers, I think in part due to the fact that we don't have the sidewalk width that we do downtown, but with these new standards um, that require the wider sidewalks, perhaps we'll get um, uh, more takers moving forward. Okay, that's great. Yeah, just something maybe to put in the mix right now, just kind of play around with it a little bit. Yeah. You guys, you know. Okay, let's take this out to the public. It is getting to be a late evening. Um, okay, for those of us, for those of us, for those who would like to comment on this item tonight, this is um, item number three on our agenda. Uh, go ahead and uh, press star nine to raise your hand. Um, and I will call on your, you by name or by your four digits of your phone number. So first off, I have Kyle Kelly. Uh, hey all, uh, thank you for the presentation and the objective standard. Uh, so I, I just want to say, uh, so I live off of West Cliff and Bay, um, and I, I would generally support uh, density along Bay uh, to include both commercial and residential. Uh, and I do even mean it in that commercial in the same sense that, that Mayor Myers is talking about you know, to create vibrant and black hole that we're in now, local businesses that we can shop at. Um, and that, you know, any any of us can can open small local businesses and be able to live right nearby where we're working uh, and be able to serve our, our neighbors. Um, so I, I really support those uses. And I just want to say, you know, as a West Side neighbor, um, I, I'd be happy to welcome more density on West Side. Thank you. Thank you. Next up is phone number ending in 2174. That's Jillian. Jillian, if you could press star six to unmute yourself. Yes, I, I believe I'm unmuted now. Thank you. Mm -hmm. And um, yes, thank you. I'll cut right to the chase. Um, I thought it was interesting in the um, survey data uh, that Spanish-speaking people were twice as likely to want building heights capped at four stories as were English-speaking people. Um, no explanation for that, but I don't think that should be lost. And connected to that is that I think people are going, I don't think the general public appreciates uh, what Councilmember Brown brought up about the density bonus. And I think in these objective standards, there needs to be a sort of a category where if a development with a density bonus, like at 130 Centre, where it's zoned for three storeys, but the project is going to be six storeys, that there could be different objective standards uh, giving some relief for the nearby people. We shouldn't lose sight of the fact that this is not where we want to be. This is imposed on us by the state. And I hope the balance is protecting existing neighbourhoods as we become more dense with these tall, dense buildings. And I, I, I'd like to address something that consultants brought up, which was people talked about privacy. But the consultants, if I remember correctly, it was early on in the evening, said they hadn't figured out how to do that. Well, I think that's pretty easy to do. And that means that any windows facing existing neighbourhoods are not openable and they're frosted and there are no decks on that side. That's an objective standard and will go a long way towards addressing the huge impacts that these very different scale buildings are going to have on single storey neighbourhoods. So I hope that can be done and I hope... Oh, okay. Thank you. Thank you, Jillian. 
Is there anyone else in the audience tonight that would um, like to speak on this item? Please press star nine, star nine to raise your hand. Okay. Uh, oh, there's one right now. Four nine six five, and then I've got uh, five six nine zero. Please press star six to unmute yourself for phone number ending in four nine six five. Uh, this is again Candace. Um, so, um, Candace Brown, I live on the east side uh, for over 40 years. Um, you know, basically, um, this exercise is codifying the quarter plan. Uh, we should not hide that fact. Um, the heights are exactly what they intended originally, which was five stories, and with the density bonus would be up to seven. When I originally proposed that, I was accused of hyperbole by advanced planning and the city manager, and that's exactly what we have. I don't think we should hide that fact. That's what we're doing. Um, reducing parking densities has a direct impact on the commercial, um, you know, four parking spaces per thousand square foot is the standard for the city. Uh, if you're proposing less, then again, you're affecting the commercial zone. And that is the commercial neighborhood commercial zone of the east side or the Midtown area. Um, and if you were to do reductions for restaurants, then again, we would be impacted directly. So um, there is no infrastructure accommodation such as a parking district or traffic um, or demand, you know, parking demand district. So there's nothing that we can fall back on to mitigate the impact of those reductions. When the affordable housing was done at um, 708 Water Street, we did a parking uh, analysis and convinced the developer that he should do, even with affordable housing, one parking space per unit. And I talked to the manager a year after it was built. They said they were glad that was the case because all, almost all the parking spaces are used up. So uh, even with affordable housing and even with 20% disabled, uh, and even though they could have done a third parking space or half a parking space, one parking space was appropriate. I just did the Excel spreadsheet with five stories, uh, and uh, I got 4.2 far. I got um, rent uh, above market rate, and this is with five stories, 100% retail, all studios, and one bedrooms, and only with one parking space. So this analysis here is showing that even that's not viable on the east side. Thank you. I could say much more, but I ran out of time. Thank you. Next up is 5690. I have three quick points. First of all, the racial equity piece would be good to distribute the multifamily zoning throughout Santa Cruz, and thank you for that, um, Council. And also, regarding the five-story buildings on Water Street, that street's a lot narrower than Ocean Street. Ocean has some three-story zoning. Doesn't really make sense. You're go you know with the density bonus, it's going to go way higher. They can get the bar, especially when lots are combined and sold together. So we really need to rethink this. Why? So why make it five when it's four? You're just asking for more of height. It doesn't make sense to keep it at four. Streamlining would not be wise because taking away public input, even now with the new state laws coming down, that's already happening. If the city council just doesn't allow the waivers, you're essentially doing the same thing. Thank you very much. Very good report, Sarah. And for Next up is Elizabeth Conlon. Hi, um, I'll be quick. I just want to say that I support the mixed use zones. I thought Council Member Brown raised a great point about um, increased heights on the west side. And I thought that some of the pictures from Sarah's presentation showed that those five story buildings could be quite um, attractive on our uh, on our corridors. Um, and I also was really struck by how whether we're whether we're talking about retail or residential construction, that it seems like there's a huge opportunity to accomplish a lot of goals by reducing parking minimums. And I hope that's something that you'll consider tackling in the future. Thank you. Is there anyone else in the audience tonight that would like to, um, to look, uh, excuse me, to speak to this item? Please press star nine on your phone. 
I'm not seeing any additional. I'll take it back to the council. Uh, I see Martine Watkins has her hand up. Thank you, Mayor. I promise I won't I won't go on and on and on. I just have one last thought. Is one I just really appreciated your comments around sort of the placemaking and the sort of the smaller uses for the um, mixed use buildings. But I had a, one additional thought in regards to um, incentivizing through these standards more childcare facilities, which we are you know grossly um, needing and are completely under um, equipped to have. And then two, I guess it's just, it doesn't necessarily have to be a question, but more of a comment for further consideration. Is there a way to integrate climate resiliency in terms of being an objective standard that could fit in terms of our, um, you know, in terms of this process? Because, you know, passive housing and other type of climate resilient resiliency in terms of building standards is, you know, has to be something that we're thinking about in terms of the future. Um, so those are my last my last few comments. And then just for clarification, it, my understanding is that we're just sort of providing input. There really isn't any action that the council's taken this evening on this item. Is that correct? That's my understanding also. Yeah, okay. that's how it's been. Yeah. Great, okay, thanks. Okay. Uh, Let's see, I've got um, Sandy, Shever, and Justin. Thank you, Mayor, and um, I'll be brief. Um, I, so I, I, reckon, I just wanna say a couple of things about um, this question of you know, reconciling um, what, what could become objective standards, which maybe aren't right now, and kind of the, the broader process beyond site and building design standards. And I really appreciate that that's been the focus of, of this effort and your work. Um, but I also think that um, as you, Sarah, have said many, many times that developing these objective standards is our opportunity to really incorporate, you know, what the, you know, our values and our priorities into this process in, in whatever ways we can. So I've been thinking about things like Climate resiliency. Are there are there ways that we can de either develop new objective standards or look at what we're already doing and try to find um, opportunities to build some of those into the overall package? Um, and another area that I think about a lot um, is, as I think you already by now know, uh, affordability. And and so I and I think that there are possible ways to, to think about how we incorporate affordability into our objective standards. And, um, you know, and I've advocate, long advocated for increasing our inclusionary percentage. That's percentage, that's a, just a very objective measure of like what percentage we require in projects. Um, and I know that that's been met with some resistance and we have been able to, what I consider to be progress has been made um, uh, in that regard and still, given the state laws and new density bonus um, uh, opportunities, we are, we are still gonna be at less than 15%. So we are, you know, we, for a while, we were just like not entirely enforcing because of legal issues. And, you know, I, I've just never seen <laughs> like a, a, um, a period of time during which projects came to us that actually brought the intended 15% affordable units. Like it just doesn't really happen. And I understand there's a lot of reasons for that and I'm not gonna go into, you know, um, kind of subjective, you know, and, and my own my own views about why. But I do think that um, given the possibilities for increasing density um, and given that the goal is to, or at least the purported goal, I'm not always sure with the state legislature, the purported goal is to increase affordability, uh, you know, in, in new housing production or with new housing production. Um, can we think about ways to find objective standards that will um, promote affordable housing development? And so inclusionary being one arena in which to have that conversation. And I, you know, so perhaps thinking about density projects or projects over a particular size might have a higher threshold, things like that. Those are, I think they would be objective standards. Um, I don't need to hear like, you know, a whole lot about it. And it's, I'm kind of posing it as a question, but I also just want to say that's a real priority for me. I would really like to see 
some exploration of that in what comes back to us. Um, and then and climate um, again, and you know, and then I think some of the areas that people in our community are, are just you know understandably concerned about um, related to the impacts on neighborhoods, um, traffic, and other impacts. And so I you know I, I know that again this has been like a, a specific piece of the objective standards development process, and I just want to advocate for making sure that we keep that more expansive view in our exploration as we get to the kind of the final document. So I'll leave it there. Thank you. And I'll, I'll send you a message, Sarah. Jim, uh, Councilman Recall, Tara Johnson. Thank you. Um, I really appreciate my colleagues' comments about sustainable buildings and considerations of um, public health considerations, given what we've just been through in the last couple of years. So I would also like to see how that could be integrated in what we have with objective standards. Um, and, you know, I just I just want to comment that I think as a council that we all really value inclusion and diversity. And, um, and, and I heard you clearly, Sarah, when, when you said that building multi-unit family, multi-family units um, projects is a way of getting there. Um, and we heard from the public comments that uh, there is a real missing middle in our community. So just, just thinking about those comments and our values, what I see as our values is inclusion and diversity. Um, I, I see that reflected in these draft objective standards and, and I really appreciate that. Um, you asked specifically about streamlining a permitting process and, and we just heard about the RENA goals um, that are coming our way in, in the very near future. And, um, you know, those numbers are huge. And um, I think if we as a community agree on a set of objective standards that where we can build responsibly, then streamlining a permitting process for those projects that meet those objective standards um, is worth looking at. Um, so I think yeah, I'll just keep my comments to that. I really, really appreciate the work. And um, again, I, I see the values of diversity and inclusion and in what we are bringing forward. So thank you. Thank you, Council Member. Council Member Cummings. Thank you, Mayor. And thank you again, staff, for the presentation. <clears throat> I have a few um, comments and I'll try to get to the point. Um, I, the first, I do want to just um, acknowledge the mayor's comments around, um, you know, kind of having these, like, kind of not just live work neighborhoods, but really trying to incorporate as many of the different, you know, things that, um, and resources that people, you know, need in their neighborhoods. So whether it's doctor's offices, pharmacies, you know, grocery stores, like trying to create walkable, livable communities is something I think that I've heard from many different people within our community, especially around how it can help us address reducing vehicle miles traveled and also just, you know, overall carbon emissions if people don't have to drive halfway across town to get to a grocery store. So I just wanted to um, acknowledge those comments and share those, those sentiments. Um, <clears throat> also, I know earlier it was brought up, but I think it would be really good, and I agree with staff that um, I think it would be great if these could go back to some of our commissions for further input. So Planning Commission, Public Works, Parks and Rec, I think getting, you know, as much community input and buy-in on this is going to be really important for us to make such an important decision moving forward with this. Um, I did have the one concern I have around some of the comments made around the multi-family home production. While I do agree, I think one of the biggest issues is that um, while that may have been the case in the past, a lot of what I've been reading now is just that the cost of building homes far and the, and the cost of renting homes far out exceeds um, what people can actually afford. And so even if we can build um, multifamily units, the the people's income has not kept up, especially people of color's income. And given that that poverty range is still being perpetuated, it's still gonna be really hard to figure out how we can get people who have been disproportionately, um, you know, kept in poverty for generations to be able to afford new units, especially when we know Housing, you know, building costs are at you know some of the highest levels we've ever seen right now. So you know that actually is going to warrant us trying to figure out how we create new programs to get 
um, people of color within those in those housing units, or not even just people of color, but people experiencing poverty into those units. And so um, that kind of leads into some of my other comments around, um, you know, what are some of the other things that we can prioritize? So um, along the lines of affordability, you know, if we can have Section 8 provisions, and, and that's very different from increasing the inclusionary because Section 8 provisions will allow for, um, you know, developers to actually get market rate back but actually have units go towards um, people who have those Section 8 vouchers who are very, who are in those very low and low-income categories. And I noticed in the staff report that if someone were to say that's subjective, um, it says that subjective standards may only be applied to development proposals in a manner that, quote, facilitates and accommodates development at the density permitted on the site and proposed by the development, and that's in California government code. And so, you know, I think that that might be an avenue we can use to actually help increase affordability in some of these projects um, while also having that be an objective standard. I um, want to share my concerns around uh, also seeing if we can prioritize environmental sustainability and climate resiliency and also quality of life, you know, knowing that, for example, in the beach flats, um, you know, if you're building housing or we're saying we're trying to support low-income residents, you know, some of those residents rely on having gardens in their backyards or to grow food uh, to sustain their families. And so that's another issue. And then also in terms of um, energy consumption, you know, if we want to promote solar, that we're not building buildings that are going to shade out people's houses where they can't actually have solar when they would have had it otherwise. And, um, and you know, I think, and then the last comment I had was that it sounded to me through um, what was said earlier that, you know, in order to shift density from one part of town to another, you'd have to have it go, you know, if it goes down in one area, it needs to go up in another. And I think it'd be really worth us trying to figure out how we can balance the density between the east and the west side. Because if the west side, if the east side has five story buildings and the west side has four, that, you know, to me, just on the surface, makes me, makes me think that there's going to be higher density on the east side than the west. And if there's a way to balance that out, I think that residents would be, um, I think that that's a, a good way to find compromise on this issue of um, really trying to, you know, address the concerns of the east side and, you know, continue to meet the needs of our density requirements as they are now. So um, those are all the comments I have. And, oh, and I just would want to say that um, currently, I know that this was brought up earlier about administrative review process. And I think that there's been a lot of just tension in the community around, for example, 831 water project and really trying to make sure that uh, these kinds of projects come to council. And so I think in terms of having a streamlined administrative review um, process, I think it would be, you know, maybe at, like initially as we adopt these objective standards and projects come to council, maybe we can start with having council be that review process. And it seems like, you know, things are going pretty smoothly. We can shift to that. But I, I would just say that from what I've heard with um, community members, kind of putting development decisions in the hands of, of staff completely is just something that people aren't comfortable with at this point in time. So those are my comments. Thank you, council member. Um, uh, I'll cue myself in here real quick. Um, I'm just going to, you might have gone over this, but I have to admit it's 10 o'clock now, so it's been a long night. Um, what, why is there the difference between the five story height on Mission Street? I think it's primarily Mission, and then the four, I'm mean, sorry, on, in, on the east side along Soquel in the, I'm looking at the zoning map or the, excuse me, the general plan designations. Um, and then you've got, so that's the M. MUH, and then you got MUM, which is primarily all along the Mission Corridor, a little bit on Almar. Um, is that is that parcel size? What 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 makes that? What's why is that different? I mean, you've got you've got the Soquel, and then you've got the Water Street Water Street Corner, obviously. Um, so I'm just curious. Can you just state, Sarah? Kind of, is that just going, dates all the way back to the general plan, so we'd have to redo those things, or just maybe clarify for the public if you can? Yeah, yeah, sure, no problem. Um, so that that's reflective of the floor area ratio and the density that's planned for those places in the general plan. So those areas that are along um, 
couple blocks of Soquel and at two nodes on Water Street at Water and Grand Supporty and um, Water and Morrissey. Those are planned for the highest intensity land use category that we have outside of the downtown. So maximum density for, you know, two bedroom plus units um, of 55 dwelling units per acre, maximum floor area ratio of 2.75. And we've gone through what that floor area ratio is. Right. And um, that was those the areas that are, you know, in that other color in the designated for the mixed use medium density, the maximum density there is 30 units per acre mm -hmm. and the maximum floor area ratio is 1.75. So a whole like one floor area ratio less. So you simply don't need the height when you have, when you don't have as much FAR, there's just, there's no need for it. So that's why the height difference is, the height difference reflects the difference in the floor area ratio and the density and the, the level of intensity of use. Now, where did that, why was that intensity of use assigned to that part of town and not to another part of town? Right which I think is also a core part of your question. So there are a couple yes. of reasons. So first of all, just let me say, I wasn't here when we wrote the general plan <laughs> and I'm a planner, so I can look at these maps and this is these are the things that I see. Number one, highway Mission Street is highway one. It's a, it's a state highway that the city does not control that right of way. So that's issue number one. Issue number two is parcel size and specifically parcel depth. So those parcels that face Mission Street are really small. And this is one of the challenges that we have with development in Santa Cruz This came out of this process and the analysis with The Economist is that these small parcels are really challenging to develop. Mm -hmm. And specifically, what's challenging is when they're not deep enough because of the way, and it all, it, a lot of this comes down to the dimensions of a parking space. And so when when parcels are narrow, it's hard to get a drive aisle in and build a building next to it if you're going to have parking in the rear. And then when part when parcels aren't deep enough, you can't put the parking in the rear. You have to put the parking underneath the building because that's all that you have. So um, with the exception of the, like, the Safeway site at Almar, um, that's a long mission, there really aren't big sites over there. I mean, maybe there's yeah. like the um, CVS site too. Like, so there's a couple, but in general, the sites that are along Sopel are deeper and they are slightly, and they're larger. I mean, they just have yeah. more um, square footage. And so those are sites where you actually could see developing like a bigger project with more density. And then with that more density comes more height. You know, it could be four stories. It could be five stories. Um, how you do that height limit then affects how much space you have on the ground floor to do a setback or a step back, right? Like we talked about all of those trade-offs. Um, and, you know, but the, the difference between that we have right now between the east side and the west side is primarily based on how those parcels exist today. That's, yeah, I looked at the map. That was what really popped out at me is the depth. And and then thinking about, you know, like, you know, one of the little old, old strip malls there um, along Mission Street, right there by the new hotel. I mean, that it's super narrow, you know, I mean, it's where the old Ome was and some of the, you know, Aeros surf shop. I mean, it's a very, very, it's a very, it's not deep, you know, so you'd end up, I, I understand what you're saying now. I mean, yeah, I mean, so there are that ways parcels, to... you know, has parking on it, you know, it's like half of it, you know, so yeah. Okay. I get where you're going. So, I mean, there are ways to, to get around that, right? Like you could look at rezoning the next site back, right? Like we could rezone a wider strip along Mission, but then you're talking about grabbing some existing single family home sites and that's incredibly right. sensitive. So, right. you know, just that's that's what we're looking at. Yeah, that I, it was really just a question for clarification. So um, it's just helpful to... Um, okay, and then um, Vice Mayor Bruner. I just had a quick comment. Um, one thing I've learned sitting on the Housing Authority Board of Commissioners is that the um, Section 8, what most people know is the Section 8 program uh, is actually called the Housing Choice Voucher Program. And um, so the term Housing Choice Voucher Program is used now instead of the term Section 8. And there are tenant-based vouchers and project-based vouchers. And I think it's important to understand um, the differences there that um, a project-based voucher um, sits with the project and stays no matter who lives there. And the tenant-based vouchers stay with the tenant 
who can then go to any unit with their voucher um, to rent. So, um, you know, if, if they're income uh, eligible and that difference is subsidized, I mean, the Housing Choice Voucher is the largest federal, sub, federally subsidized program. And so um, the way that we can maximize on project-based vouchers, my understanding is developers can apply um, and there's a formula um, for that. So I just wanted to share that. Thank you, Vice Mayor. Appreciate it. Um, any other council members with closing comments or? Um, yeah, I mean, I mean, again, I'll just wrap you know mine up. I, I think that um, the, the the hike is going to be a struggle. You know, I mean, it's it's just we're a small town, and 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 it. You know, I was curious about. I guess one other question for you guys was, you know, as you sort of talk about Santa Cruz, a lot of people don't realize. You know, I mean, we've we've wrapped our town in a green belt. You know, and that green belt probably almost close to I don't know how big it is, but it's pretty big. It's over seven or eight hundred acres, I would imagine, if you added it all up. Did, did that setting come into any of your discussions when you're sort of framing framing the discussion in, 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 in terms of like why Santa Cruz kind of is what it is? Because, you know, a typical town would be looking at these, ex, you know, kind of growing outward, right? That next annexation, that next action to try to get at that vacant land that, you know, has the value that can accommodate whatever it is, mixed use, you know, or a, a single family, all those things that we see, you know, this hopscotch pattern that happens in town. Did that, I mean, and, and when I say to people, sometimes when we're talking about the density and how we're, you know, I don't know how we're gonna fit 3,400 units, but we've also made a very deliberate decision that we've actually, a lot of our land area is just not available. It's protected into perpetuity. And so, you know, there, the right there is already, you know, sort of like, and then we've got the ocean on one side. So, you know, got you got a three-sided box. We've taken part of the box apart and said we can't use it. And then we got the ocean on the other side. So, you know, it, it did that come into any of the sort of scene setting as you kind of talk about the development pattern of Santa Cruz? I'm just curious. Um, so... I would say, actually, people tended to understand that sort of implicitly. Okay. I was actually really okay. impressed that they yeah. were, you know, we want to have efficient use of our existing urban land resources. And the idea that we might sprawl beyond these boundaries did, did, was not even on the table for right. folks. It was like, where, how are we going to, there is, as we've discussed, tension about exactly in what neighborhood does this belong, exactly what intensity belongs in my own neighborhood. Um, and I mean, I think that's, that's a tension that exists in just about every Every community. The nation, yeah. if not the world, right? Um, so Santa Cruz isn't the only place that's having this challenge right now. Um, but people really understand that, you know, we're a compact community. We're a full service city. We are the center of economic activity for the county. And um, growth is going to happen here. We have to figure out how we're going to live with it. Yeah. Thank you. No, that's great to hear. Um, yeah, so, my, you know, my comments are very similar to what you've already heard. Um, uh, you know, and I think um, I, I think I think also a lot from what I understand talking with people who do do development here or do development anywhere, you know, it, there's some parcels that are just very hard to develop. And I know that sounds kind of um, disingenuine, but based on what you've, you know, the land value, what you purchased it for, you know, your mortgage, all these different factors. Sometimes there's just not a lot of parcels that can really make, you know, the things that we want, you know, all the affordability, all the different parcels. And 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 I so I think that's part of, you know, kind of for our community to think about is, you know, a, you know, a pink, a pink drawing around a parcel may or may not result. It, you know, it's, you know, we have to have these objective standards. We have to provide this guidance. That's what was missing. We missed, you know, and that, and these things will bring us more to, into a community com conversation. Um, so I, I think, um, you know, it's, but it is a hard, sometimes these are just hard to fit on parcels that exist. 
And then I guess um, I would like to understand a little bit more and explore a little bit more um, about the concepts of, of sort of incentivizing. And, you know, and I, and I appreciated my colleagues' comments about, you know, how, how do you um, provide incent incentives, but how do you also retain some of that quality control? How do you retain some of the ability to really um, make sure that projects are a good fit? And so I, I know that's kind of almost impossible, but certainly the state has taken a pretty, pretty, pretty direct hit at that. So how we do that with our own decision making will be, I think, important to discuss a little bit more. And that will be it for me. Um, so with that, um, if there aren't any other comments from other council members, we will call it a night. And we will adjourn. Thank you, everyone. The next Thank you. city council meeting will be on December 14th. Thanks, everybody. Have a good night.